Shit. All right. Today we're reacting to Jordan Peterson's discussion with Destiny, the streamer. Yeah. Jordan Peterson, the pirate, apparently, and Destiny, the streamer. I guess we might as well start by letting the people who don't know who you are get to know who you are with a little bit more precision. So why have you become known and, and how has that developed? Pretty broad question. <laughs> like um, immediately, it's just crazy the way you ask those questions. Why have you become I, known? I want to start by it, for anyone who doesn't know who you are. Can you explain who you are with more precision? Well, if they don't know who he is, you don't even need to qualify. Yeah, you know what? I don't want to go over it, but it's just so funny. It's just how did you become known? Like yeah. if not like how did you get into content creation? That's a good freeze frame, also. Mm -hmm. I think I started streaming around 15 years ago when it wasn't really a thing yet. There were a few people that did it. Uh, I started early on. I was a, well, I guess back then you weren't a professional gamer yet because the game had just started to come out. But there was a game called StarCraft II, and I streamed myself playing that game. I was a pretty good player. It was pretty entertaining to watch. And then I kind of grew uh, over, I guess, maybe the next seven years, uh, just streaming that people would watch. Streaming on YouTube? Um, well, back then, I started on a website called Livestream. Then I switched mm -hmm. to Ustream. Then I switched to a site called Justin TV. You already know all of this. It's <laughs> your destiny. I knew that he was the first, was the first uh, full time streamer. I think is my understanding. That's what he's saying. He's self proclaimed first full time streamer, but I, I don't think we know. No, but he was in that first wave. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And then that turned into Twitch TV. Uh, so after streaming there for like seven or eight years, I was a semi professional StarCraft two gamer. That game kind of came and went, but I had a lot of other interests. Around 2016, I started to get more involved into the world of politics. It's kind of a left leaning figure. Of uh, because my background in like esports. What's your perception of how mainstream he is at this point? Because he's he's sitting like Shapiro. You know, Hassan talks about him a lot, obviously. He's doing Peterson. He's on Lex. He talks to, like, Chank Uger. Like, seems like he's just known by a lot of major figures online. Well, so do you think Jordan Peterson and Ben Shapiro are mainstream? Y yeah. All right. Then I'd say he's probably pretty, pretty close. That's that's quite a development from where he was like, five years ago. Well, yeah, absolutely. But uh, he's just, like, who's this? Who's the bigger – who's the next biggest person after Hassan on the left? In terms of online commentators, yeah. Um, maybe, maybe David Pakman. I think he's got millions. Of I mean, yeah, you could throw like it, it's, it would either be someone like Pacman or like if you wanted to count the Young Turks as an institution. Yeah. I just think the issue the is that Destiny's a streamer, Pacman isn't. You know. Yeah. So Destiny's probably the second largest political left wing streamer, right? After Hassan, like Hassan gets like what twenty eight thousand viewers, and Destiny gets like eleven, twelve thousand. Yeah. I think he's going to pass him in the next couple of well, years. Well, yeah, probably. Hassan's just continuing to go down. Destiny's going up. Sports and internet gaming and internet trash talk. Like I, got, I had more of a kind of like a combative attitude. And that was kind of rare mm. for left-leaning people at the time. So it's basically where my early political popularity came from. I think from like 2016 to 2018 was debating right-wing people. So was there a game-like element to the debating, yeah. do you think? And, and is that part of is that part of why that morphing made sense? No, I wouldn't say so. I mean, if you, if you get really reductionist, everything in life is kind of a game, but that's not very satisfying. Uh, I think I grew up like very argumentative. My mm. mom is from Cuba, so my family was like very conservative. And then I grew up like listening to the news all day, listening to my mom's political opinions all day. And then I argued with kids in high school and everything. And I've always been kind of like an argumentative, type A aggressive personality. So I think that probably lent itself well to the political stuff in 2016. Yeah. Was that useful in gaming? Um, that, that personality? In some ways, yeah. In some ways, no. Um, okay. I don't know directly for the games itself. I don't know how much it necessarily mattered. Uh, but for all the peripheral stuff, in some ways, it was really beneficial. I could kind of like cut out my own path, and I could be very unique, and I could kind of be on my own. In some ways, it was very detrimental. Uh, I'm very, I can be very difficult to get along with, and I'm very mm -hmm. much kind of like, a, I want to do this thing, and if you try to tell me what to do, I don't want to have like a sponsor or a team or anybody kind of with a leash on me. So yeah, I guess it worked well, out. It's in interesting the because that the temperamental proclivity that you're describing that's associated with low agreeableness. And yeah. generally, well, and that's good. I bet he laughed because, dude, I swear, like five percent of Jordan's content was about is about like agreeableness. Is it? Well, I mean, that's just like stuff that I've seen him talking about how like women are much less agreeable, mm -hmm. uh, or much more agreeable, and men typically are much much less agreeable. Yeah, it seemed like he was revolving around a lot of that, and I think that's when he was getting canceled because he was talking about a lot of like. That might be the happiest I've ever seen Destiny. <laughs> I don't know if he's happy. He's just laughing at what he said, but yeah. It's more combative, it's more stubborn, sure. it's more implacable, uh -huh. it's more competitive. The, the downside is that it's more skeptical, It's it can be more cynical, it, it can be less cooperative. But generally, a temperament like that is associated with, is not associated with political belief on the left, because the leftists tend to be characterized by um, higher levels of compassion, and that's low agreeableness. Uh -huh. So, you know, that element of your temperament, at least, is quite masculine. And a lot of the ideology that characterizes the modern left has a much more temperamentally feminine nature. So, so all right. So, 
why do you think the shift from your part? Do you find this interesting? Like, I don't know if this is his show, but like the idea that he's, it seems like he's sort of trying to construct like a psychological uh, understanding of destiny. Yeah, I did find it really interesting. He's doing like a like psychological, profile, which he is actually I mean, qualified to do. Yeah, yeah, I mean, he's sitting like they're in a therapist's office. You know, like he's got he's got his notebook up. He's taking he's taking notes, asking questions about like the mental state and like what but do you think this means? This these are his notes, I guess. Yeah. What's what's this? It's his phone. Why is it so fucking big? It seems like a regular big phone. I don't know. Like, does he have something on there? I, I don't know. Popularity to exactly. political commentary worked and. You said that started about 2016. And why do you think that that shift happened for you, like in terms of your interest? I think I've always been interested in a lot of things. Like I grew up with a very strong political bend. It was conservative until I got into my streaming years, probably five or six years of streaming. I slowly kind of started to shift to the left. Hmm. Um, I would say that... Uh, <laughs> it would be so funny if every movie had a notebook but never took down notes. And like when he heard something that he pretend that when he heard something that he thought was interesting or pretended to make it look like he was interested, you're like, hmm... But he's not continues his drawing, yeah. or just like there's no ink in the pen, or just lose it halfway through. He's like, just because here's this drawing I've been working on of a cat the entire time. Do yeah. you like it? Because <laughs> his his thing is that he's like a psychologist, right? Yeah, you know, so like he's trying to keep that mantra up, even though maybe he's lost it entirely. And he's just, you yeah. know, put a little, put I want to see them debate shit. I guess in around around 2016, when I saw all the conversations going on with the election and when all the issues being talked about, I just I felt like the conversations were very low quality. Right here, let's start talking more broadly than on the political side. So. How would you characterize the difference, in your opinion, between the left and the conservative political viewpoints? Um, oof, uh, on a on a very, very, very broad level, um, if there's some, I would say if there's some like good good world that we're all aiming for, I think people on the left uh, seem to think that a uh, a collection of taxes from a large population that goes into a government that's able to precisely kind of dole out uh, where that tax money goes. Uh, you're basically able to take the problems of society. You're able to scrape off, hopefully, uh, uh, not super significant amount of money from people that are that can afford to give a lot of money. And then through government programs and redistribution, you target that uh, that those taxes essentially to people that kind of need uh, whatever bare minimum to take okay. advantage of opportunity okay. society. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I think it'd be really interesting because like Destiny's talked about how he hates that like you can never really get into specifics a lot. If him or like some left wing or some right wing if these two groups of people create a podcast together and like like ben shapiro and destiny created one and like every episode like they'd be able to like get flesh things more out in detail i think that'd be really exciting that'd be super interesting but do you think um now that i think about it i don't know if the people on the right would want to do that i mean you know, do you know what, i think do you know what a, i think they benefit so much from like the broad <clears throat> narratives they don't you know what rising, rising is rising? Rising? breaking points now no your crystal ball no you know kyle Klonsky. Like I've heard of all these things, but I don't uh, know what they are. She's like a, a left, like political person, like who was kind of in the mainstream world. Now I think they do mostly online, but that's the structure of the show. It's like a, a left wing person, a right wing person, but it's the same same two people every time. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, that's super. But it's a little bit more of a news show than a uh, like debate show. Okay. Because that would be a debate show like that would be really great, but this might be like my bias towards um, left wing thought, but I feel like. I don't know if Ben Shapiro or Candace Owens or any of these people would benefit from that because they benefit so much from like macro level, like conspiracy theory or like macro level, big idea stuff. And like when you get into <laughs> the nitty gritty, which it seems like, you know, bias again, like destiny is very, very good at that stuff. Yeah. Well, I mean, this it what, wouldn't benefit. I think most, all. most left wing people wouldn't want to do it either. Like if you yeah, just most people at all. all. Yeah. But you know, that's how Tucker Carlson got started. His first show is on CNN. It was called Crossfire. Yeah, it was him and then a, a Democratic guy. And yeah, they, no, they, that's great. They, it was, a, but it was like a horrible show. Oh, why? Because it was just like so fake. Oh, yeah, no, that's not good. Yeah. And then for on the conservative yeah. end, um, I guess a conservative would generally think that why would the government take my money? I think from a community point of view, through churches, through community action, through families, we can better allocate our own dollars to our own friends and family to help them and give them the things that they need so that they can better participate in a thriving society, basically. Okay, so one of the things that I've always found a mystery, and I think there's an equal mystery on the left and on the right in this regard, is that the more conservative types tend to be very skeptical of big government, and the leftist types tend to be more skeptical of big corporations. Right? Well, you okay, so mm -hmm. following through the logic that you just laid out, you mm -hmm. made the suggestion that one of the things that characterizes people on the left is the belief that government can act as an agent of distribution can and should act as an agent of distribution. Uh -huh. Okay, a potential problem for that is the gigantism of the government that does that. Now, the conservatives are skeptical of that gigantism. And likewise, the 
liberals, the progressives in particular, we'll call them progressives, um, are skeptical of the reach of gigantic corporations. And I've always seen a commonality in those two in that both of them are skeptical of gigantism. And so one of the things that I concerned about, generally speaking, with regard to the potential for the rise of tyranny is the emergence of, of giants. And one potential problem with the view that the Same government thing. can and should act as an agent of redistribution is that there is an incentive put in place, two kinds of incentives. Number one, a major league incentive towards gigantism and tyranny. And number two, an incentive for psychopaths who use compassion to justify their grip on power, to take money and to claim that they're doing good. And I see that happening everywhere now in the name of, particularly in the name of compassion. And it's one of the things that's made me very skeptical in particular about the left and at least about the progressive edge. Why does he always talk like about giants and dragons and it's not like, a word. Myth. That's not a word. Gigantism? Like it's a word in in relation to like physical like medicine. Like hormonal stuff. It's not okay. It's not a word. Well but yeah, what are you saying? Just why does he talk in giants and dragons and beasts and like Because he's wearing a fucking uh pirates. He's wearing a one he's wearing cosplay. a one piece fucking blazer. Yeah. You don't you don't like I don't know. Stuff. That's why I said pirates, but yeah. Yeah. I don't know. He's a weird fucking it's really freak. odd. He's always talking in like hieroglyphs. Edge of the left. So I'm curious about what you think about those two. First of all, it's it's a paradox to me that the conservatives and the leftists face off each other with regard to their concern about different forms of gigantism and don't seem to notice that the thing that unites them is some antipathy. This is especially true for the libertarians, some antipathy towards gigantic structures per se. And so then I would say, with regards to your antithesis between liberalism and conservatives, the conservatives are pointing to the fact that there are intermediary forms of distribution that can be utilized to solve the social problems that you're describing that don't bring with them the associated problem of gigantism. And like this is a, it's been shocking to me to watch the left, especially in the last six years, ally itself, for example, with pharmaceutical companies. You just realized it's time for him to start talking about some things. He's not asking Destiny questions anymore. It's, yeah. I'm putting a notepad down and giving you my spiel. Which was something I'd never saw, never thought I would see in my lifetime. I mean, yeah. for, for decades, the only gigantic corporations the left was more skeptical of than the fossil fuel companies were the pharmaceutical companies. And that all seemed to vanish overnight around the COVID time. So I know the story. That's a lot of things to throw at you, uh -huh. but it sort of outlines the territory that we could probably investigate productively. Yeah. So a couple of things. I would say that the current political landscape we have, I think, is less. Uh, I understand the the concept of conservatives supporting corporations and liberals support, uh, supporting like large government. I think today the divide we're starting to see more and more is more of like a populist, uh, anti-populist rise or even like an institutional or anti-institutional rise. So, for instance, I think conservatives today in the United States are largely characterized with, uh, I would say, with populism and uh, that they're supporting like certain figures, namely right now Donald Trump, who they think alone can kind of like lead them against the corrupt institutions, uh, be them corporate or government. I feel like I feel like most conservatives today are not as trustful of, of big corporations as they were back in like the Bush era where we would, you know, conservatives would champion, you know, big yeah, corporations. Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah. Um, I that's think a strange thing because it makes the modern conservatives a lot more like the 60s leftists. Potentially, yeah. Um, I mean, that brings us into the issue, too, of whether the left-right divide is actually a reasonable way of construing the current political landscape at all. And I'm not sure it is, but... Right now, it kind of is, but... It's it's weird that Jordan Peterson's kind of supposed to be the smart guy, you know, and, like, have a lot of answers. But he also leaves so many things open-ended by saying, like, I'm not sure it is. Like, I don't know the question to that. I mean, I don't know the answer to that. You know, like, what does this even mean? These are just, like, really complex discussions. <clears throat> and they have it on, like, really... It's just, Back. it's almost made confusing by how little it's explored, you know? Yeah, I agree. But only because so many conservatives are following Trump. So like your populist, anti-populist thing kind of maps on kind of cleanly to the left and right. It doesn't work with progressives though, or the far left, because they're also anti-large everything. So in a surprising way on very, very far left people, you might find them having a bit more in common with kind of like a mega Trump supporter uh, than like a center left liberal. So for instance, like both of these groups of people on the very far left will be very dovish on foreign policy, probably a little bit more isolationist. They're not a big fan of like a ton of immigration or a ton of trade with other countries. Uh, they might think that there's a lot of institutional capture of both government and corporate. So both all of the mega supporters and the far, far left might think that corporations don't have our best interest at heart and the government is corrupt and captured by mm -hmm. lobbyists. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, you'll see a lot yeah. of overlap there. Right. Um, I think that sometimes uh, there's a couple things. One, uh, this is something I feel like I've discovered. People have no principles. Uh, I think that people are largely guided by whatever is kind of satisfying them. I said that shit like a few months ago. He's copying you.
People don't have principles anymore. I've been saying that. We're making them feel good at the time. I think that's a really important thing to understand because people's beliefs will seem to change at random. If you're trying to uh, imagine that a belief is coming from some underlying principle or is governed by some internal. And yeah, the craziest, the biggest example that I can think of right now is how many Trump supporters there are that um, you originally, oh, you're just being him, that you would normally think are, you know, anti fascist or um, anti authoritarian government, but a bunch of them now, at least you see in clips, and I don't know how, how representative this is of the general Trump masses, but they're just like, yeah, I, I'd take Trump for 20 more years if he yeah. wanted to be a dictator. I think a lot of the economic stuff they're talking about is, is kind of a mirage because like what the point that Jordan made about pharmaceutical companies, like the left is allying themselves with corporations more like mm -hmm. in regard to like Pfizer and COVID is what he's talking about. Yeah. It's like, yeah, they might be more pro-vaccine, but ultimately – they want to tax those companies more and regulate them more. Yeah. And like Republicans, yeah, they might hate pharmaceutical companies and tech companies, you know, but do they want to lower their taxes or raise them? You know, do they want to break up those companies or, or leave them as they are and just like not, they don't like the social views of them. You know, mm -hmm. it's like, it seems like when it really comes to policy, which is what this was, what politics is about, you know, it's not about how you feel. It's about what do you want the government to do? Yeah. Like, I don't really think that the right has become anti-corporate in a meaningful way nor has the left become like pro-establishment mm -hmm. oh yeah specifically corporate yeah. i'd say you know i don't think that's that's a real yeah thing, like they're probably know? super pro um i don't know like uh what's it called like bass pro shop or whatever like they'd probably be super happy if like they had a monopoly in that market yeah you know? yeah exactly and it's like it's just whatever, why... whatever whatever company you enjoy you don't mind how big they are. And then like when he's talking about protectionism, it's like there are people on the right and left who are protectionist and anti-protectionist. Like it, it's so muddled. Same with immigration. You yeah. Know? It's not principled. It's purely based off of the company you like or like the social um, position you have. Yeah. So I feel like the left right thing when you're talking, they shouldn't be talking about economics. That seems like a, a much worse way to understand what left right means than as a social cultural thing. Yeah. You know. Uh, you know, like moral or a reasonable code or whatever. I think generally there are large social groups that people kind of follow them along from thing to thing, which is why you end up in strange worlds sometimes where, uh, you know, like the, the position on vaccines and being an anti-vaxxer might have been seen as something, you know, 10 years ago, it's kind of like a hippie leftist. And now maybe it's more like a conservative or uh, it's associated more with like mega Trump supporters or whatever. I think as a result of how the social groups move around. Um, when it comes to the, you, you mentioned this like gigantism thing. That's another thing where I'm not sure if people actually care about gigantism or if they're using it as a proxy for other things that they don't like. Like, I could totally imagine... Well, I care about it. Sure, yeah, you might. Yeah, sorry. I'm just saying okay. in general, That's yeah. That's okay. Because, um, like, I could imagine somebody saying that, like, they don't trust, like, a large government. They think there's too much, uh, you know, prone to tyranny or something like that, but also be supportive of an institution like the Catholic Church, which is literally, you know, one guy who is a direct right, line to God. Right, but they can't tax. Um, well, I mean, and they don't have a military. That and is, they can't conscript you. True, right? yeah. And they can't throw you in jail. <laughs> no, that is true, yeah. I mean, I, right, chill. Well, those are major. Those are major and significant. I mean, I get, the, mm -hmm. I get the overlap. Don't get me wrong. Sure, but, but I'm saying, like, even if you had a local government, like a local, like if you had a state government or a tribe, usually they've got some form of enacting punishment. It'll be sometimes more brutal, but they can throw you in jail. Uh, conscription hasn't existed in the U.S. since the Vietnam War. Um, yeah. I mean, yeah, <laughs> true. Yeah, yeah, true. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> what the fuck, dude? I love those yeah, Jordan true. moments because, like, what the fuck is he talking? He just seems like someone who's actually like unwell. I think he just didn't like Destiny's point, so he's he just oh, he he got me. Yeah, he true. seems so like unwell. Usually, they've got some form of an acting punishment. It'll be sometimes more brutal, but they can throw you in jail. Okay. Uh, conscription hasn't existed in the U.S. since the Vietnam War. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, <laughs> yeah, true. Yeah, yeah, true. Um, so yeah, I think that. Um, yeah, true. I guess when I look at so uh, this is so okay, let's go, go yeah, back. Go ahead, well, we let's go back to yeah, the, sure. to the redistribution issue. Uh -huh. I mean, we pay. Is, here's my problem with Jordan Peterson, right? It feels like he has no point, you know? Yeah. Like he just, it, it's like, like what he says is like, if I was taking a, a test in class and yeah. the question was like, uh, how, how does the, the society and government work? And then I just had no idea what to say. And I just rambled for a while. Yeah. Like when you're on a test and you don't know the answer or something. You do what Jordan Peterson does. Yeah, exactly. You just like say a bunch of different shit. You don't really stand too firm behind any of it because you don't want to be guaranteed to be wrong. So yeah. you'll, clo you'll cloak everything and what you were saying earlier where it's like, I don't know, you know? Yeah. And it, none of it really relates. There's no really point at the end. You're just, you're referencing a lot of things. It's JP theory. Yeah. And you're just using big words. Yeah. He actually is a, a, like a big word thing. You he, know? he is the big word guy. 65% of our income at say upper middle class, middle class to upper middle class level in Canada. It isn't obvious to me at all that that money is well. That's, that's not, not the true. Tax it's like no 40%. It's 40%, I think. 
it, was he saying that's the money that they keep or the money that they are taxed at? We pay 65% of our income. That is not that's true. Not and he's saying we pay. He's way higher than middle up or upper middle class. Mm -hmm. So maybe he pays more. But I know that my mom and that's like we're just, just so we can prove this. I think it's worth pulling up another tab. Just look up Canada federal tax brackets. Yeah, sure. And of course, there are provincial taxes. You can look at that too, but no one is paying 65%. Like you said, 40 is probably around the ceiling, you know? I'd imagine it's even way lower for the average working class person. Yeah, I just don't think that's true. Um, All right, here are the Canadian tax brackets. Okay, here, let me just pull this up real quick. Sorry, guys. There you go. So these first two brackets here are what I'd consider uh, what he's talking about, middle class, upper middle class. These ones right here? Yeah, maybe the top three, you could say. Okay, so 2024 taxable income. The highest tax bracket is 33%. That is half of what he said it is. Yeah. And also, these are marginal tax rates. Yeah. So it's like a percentage of yours gets taxed. Yeah. Like if you're making 60 grand, your first 55 is getting taxed at 15. And mm -hmm. only that last four grand is getting taxed at 20. Yeah, exactly. You know, like that's just insane. The highest is 33%. And he just said 65 because that's what the point has to be, right? I would imagine even if you're making 200K and you're living in Vancouver, you know, mm -hmm. or like that's a bad example. You're living in uh, Toronto, right? Yeah. Because I'd imagine Alberta probably has lower provincial taxes. Um, yeah, probably. But there's no no one's paying them higher than forty. There's no way. No, that, that's just, and he's just, he just said sixty five percent. At say upper middle class, middle class to upper middle class level in Canada, it isn't obvious to me at all that that money is well used. In fact, quite the contrary. In my country now, um, our citizens make sixty percent of they produce sixty percent of what you produce in the U.S. That's plummeted over the last twenty years as state intervention has increased. I'm not. Why doesn't he just move? Do you think it's? Do you think there's so much benefit to his? Um, like, does um, he still live in Canada? I don't know. Even know he probably doesn't. Why would you live in Canada? I yeah. want to move. Um, but like, if you keep, do you think he's he has to be like the guy to say? Like, I, I disagree with that with the argument you're making, though. I'm making the point that um, him saying that like Republicans say that all the time about no, liberals. No, well, I'm saying that he says Canada's bad, and Canada's more left wing. So like, you can kind of like shove in. Um, more like left Canada bad stuff. If you're like, say you're a Canadian and like that can like just take the spot of like left is bad. And say yeah, it's just bad. a proxy for taxation. And like, if you really investigate everything you're saying, it doesn't make sense. Like, like you said, we produce 60% of the stuff that the US produces. Mm -hmm. Like, what are you referring to there? What do yeah. you mean? Like, is the GDP 60%? Yeah. And then you're saying as government control has increased, that number's fallen. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you mean by government control increasing? Is it the percentage of the GDP they've owned? Yeah. And I'm, I'm sure the GDP has grown in the last 20 years. Definitely has. Yeah. Are you saying the rate has slowed? Like, because that's and, different and then from also, we, yeah. how, how can you prove that that's causal? You yeah. know, but like, none, he just, Runs it off. Well, it's because you know? that's that's my point. And that goes back to what I was saying about like if you had the conservative and the liberal, um, or I mean I shouldn't say conservative liberal, if you had Destiny and Jordan Peterson have a podcast and it was like one topic for three hours every week, mm -hmm. um, that wouldn't benefit Jordan at all. <laughs> that would benefit Destiny because I think get it would the nitty -gritty. Get Jordan a lot more credibility with the left and center, honestly. Yeah, but he he's entire he's probably ninety nine percent right wing viewership, or maybe maybe eight yeah. percent. And he's been able to protect himself benefit. a decent amount by not. I don't think he goes out there and actually says he's a conservative very often. Nah, dude, he isn't protected. People already hate Jordan Peterson. Like on the, on the left. left. Yeah, no, people don't like him already. That's true. But like, whereas someone like uh, like uh, Stephen Crowder, you know, or Alex Jones. Yeah, I guess technically like, Jordan Peterson does have a... hates those people. I think the center actually really likes people like Jordan Peterson and Joe yes. Rogan. You yeah, know? that's probably true. Convinced that the claim that the interests of people who lack opportunity are best served by state intervention. And there's there's a couple of reasons for that. I mean, first of all, I'm aware of the relationship between inequality and social problem. Uh -huh. There's a very well-developed literature on that. And it, it essentially shows that. Also, the issue that I don't like is he always talks about American politics, but he says like taxation is bad. Well, we're getting taxed 65% and Canada's and we're not doing anything about it. And then he'll go and talk about <laughs> American issues. So yeah. he's saying like, look, yeah, look how bad it is in Canada. And use that as like it being how bad it is in America and then talk about American issues, you know? I, I also just, I mean, I'll let him make his argument, but then I have a response to what he said. The more arbitrary, the, the, the broader the reach of inequality in, in a political institution of any given size, the more social unrest. So where people, where all people are poor, there isn't much social unrest. And where all people are rich, there isn't much social unrest. But when there's a big gap between the two, there's plenty. And that's mostly driven by disaffected young men who aren't very happy that they can't climb the hierarchy. They're 
or barriers in their way. And so there is reason to ameliorate relative poverty. The problem with that to some degree is that most attempts to ameliorate relative poverty tend to increase absolute poverty, and they do it dramatically. And the only solution that we've ever been able to develop to that is something approximating a free market system. I wouldn't call it a capitalist system because I think that's capture of the terminology by the radical leftists. It's a free exchange. That is not true. Like the first part is true about the social unrest and how it is mostly uh, young men uh, who, like, if you're talking about like crime rates and stuff like that, mm -hmm. like young men of all races between the ages of 16 and 25 are the number one uh, driver of crime, you yeah. know, which I think is the social unrest he's talking about. Um, but in regards to whether that's fi fixed by government policy, it is absolutely true that uh, capitalism, which I guess he doesn't like that term for some reason. Because it's been co-opted by the radical left. Poorly or something. Apparently. Um, ha has lifted a ton of people out of poverty, especially in the third world when you liberalize certain markets. Um, but it's also true that social programs have, have uh, in uh, cut poverty rates massively. Like I know since uh, Medicare was established in the 60s, uh, the poverty rate for seniors was at like 30%. And now it's at like 5%. Mm -hmm. You know, like there are a lot of programs that have done a lot to reduce poverty. I don't even know what the fuck he's talking about when he says like, like how can, how can a welfare program increase poverty like i guess if it's horribly mismanaged or something yeah it's, but like when you're talking about stuff like medicare like medicaid uh public housing like in general this stuff works out pretty well you know if you want to talk about handing people money that might be slightly different but when it comes to like food stamps housing yeah. healthcare, that stuff is generally always going to cut poverty mm -hmm. you know it's not an honest argument yeah no i agree change system and the price you pay for a free exchange system is you still have inequality but the advantage you gain is that the absolute levels of privation plummet. And I think the data on that are, I think they're absolutely conclusive, especially, and that's been especially demonstrated in the radical decrease in rates of poverty since the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1989, because we've lifted more people out of poverty in the last four decades than we had in the entire course of human history up to that date. And that's not least because the statist interventionist types who argued for a radical... Why does it feel like he's arguing with Destiny, but Destiny wouldn't disagree with... Like, well, I'm really curious what Destiny's going to say. State-sponsored redistribution lost the Cold War, right? And that freed up Africa to some degree, and certainly the Southeast Asian countries, to pursue something like a free trade economy. And that instantly even... That instantly made them rich, even China. So, well, so that's an argument, let's say, on the side of free exchange, but it's also an argument, a twofold argument, pointing out how we ameliorate absolute poverty, which should be a concern for leftists, but doesn't seem to be anymore, by the way. And also an argument for the maintenance of a necessary inequality. Like, I'm not sure that inequality can be decreased beyond a certain degree without that decrease causing other serious problems. And we can talk about that, but, mm -hmm. but it's a um, complicated problem. Yeah, but for one point of clarification, when you say leftist, what do you mean by that? Well, we, I was going with your definition, like mm -hmm. essentially the, 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 the core idea being something like, the, the central problem being one of relative inequality and distribution of resources and mm -hmm. the central solution to that being something like state-sponsored economic intervention. I mean, there's other ways we could define left sure. and right, and we can do be, that, but, yeah, I, I but I'll be, stick with the one that you brought forward to begin with. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay. I, I only want to be clear on that because um, uh, people get mad if I call myself a leftist. Um, uh, oftentimes online or in, especially in Europe or worldwide, leftists will ex uh, refer exclusively to like socialists or communists. And anybody to the right of that would be considered like a liberal. If you no, would, like, usually a, a fascist. Well, <laughs> it depends. Very on rapidly. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to be clear on that. Uh, so I'm absolutely a pro capitalist, pro free market guy. Um, I'm, not, I'm never going to. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, that, that's good. It's good to get that. See, this is what I mean. Like he's like throwing like his typical arguments against someone who might be far left or. He probably thinks there's way more people that are far left, but Destiny's um, center left compared to him, like moderate, you know, or no, no, compared to him, he's still like well, he's still left leaning, mm -hmm. but um, agrees with a lot of like the positions that um, Jordan probably holds. I find Destiny's economic views to be very elusive. His economic positions, yeah, I'm just not really sure where he stands on a lot of stuff. Yeah, I don't. Maybe he'll go on an on an economic arc or whatever. Yeah. Right now, he I mean, he might explain a lot right here. I don't right know. now, he's on a, on a research arc. Or I think he just finished it where he was looking into. Like a bunch of different, he made a bunch of different questions about like, uh, is like essentially is college and university worth it? Yeah, I think that's an interesting topic. I'm I'm excited he's doing. And I think this will happen like that. more. That's like ever since he did started taking Vivance, I think it was not Adderall. Um, he just hasn't played video games. He's just doing research. I think that's what he's gonna do. Israel Palestine took up like four months of that, but yeah. he's getting. Away. I just like I have a lot of questions for you. Like, I'm like, I'm curious. Like I don't know. Like like what do you want the minimum wage to be? Yeah. What kind of healthcare system? Do you I think want he's. I think he already said he doesn't like. Um, I feel like he said he didn't like like an, a federal fifteen dollar minimum wage, but I, don't, I think he thinks state by state makes more sense. Yeah, well, then I feel like he should be talking about that more. Well, know? someone just has to ask him, and he will. I don't think he's holding yeah. any of the positions back.
not clear why. Yeah. Um, because uh, I would argue that when you look at like the fall of the Soviet Union or you look at the fail failure of like socialist or communist regimes, uh, I don't know if the issue there was so much redistribution. I think the problem- That was one of many issues. I don't think it was an issue at all, actually, I would say. I think the issue was uh, command- Wait a minute, wait, yeah, a, go ahead. wait yeah. a minute. What, what do you mean redistribution wasn't an issue? What the hell do you think they did to the kulaks? <clears throat> that was forced redistribution. It resulted in the in the death of 6 million people. So maybe I'm not understanding what you mean, but that was redistribution at its at its like pinnacle. Sure. And forced redistribution. And when it was I, brutal. When I, when I think of the, uh, when I think of the strengths of capitalism, um, the ability for markets to dynamically respond to shifting consumer demand is like the reason why capitalism and free market economies dominate the world. When you've got socialist or communist systems, uh, command economies where a government is trying to say, this is how much this is going to cost, this yeah. is how much you're going to produce and make. The, this is a failed way of managing a, a state economy. Even in places where they still do it, there are always shadow economies and stuff. There were in the Soviet Union that prop up where people try to uh, basically ameliorate the conditions that are resulting from said horrible command economy practices. Uh, so I guess in a way you could argue a command economy is kind of like redistribution. It's a form of it. but No, it's a worse problem. I, if, yeah, you're, yeah. if you're pointing to the fact that that's a worse problem, I'm... I'm yeah, I would say that's percent. definitely the reason why these places uh, failed because they just weren't able to respond to changing okay, conditions. Okay, so what's the difference between... Going online without ExpressVPN Kills hotel touches your pack thousand dollars per person. Fuck Express via P VPN Nord for life. Nord for life. Do you got Nord? I don't have a VPN. Oh. What do you use a VPN for? I want to watch some porn. Why don't you just watch an incognito? It doesn't protect you enough from what? Um, from people incognito doesn't really do much. I know what, for your service provider, yeah, but why do you care? Um, I guess I've just always done it, you know, yeah. Like, like I, this is the thing, my dad's super safety brain, like, he has like a whole um, like he has this app that like will change um, the code or like not the code change, like what his email looks like. So he uses mm -hmm. that email and sends it out to people whenever, like he doesn't know who they are. I don't give a shit if people like, I like, I don't need a VPN. Like people can look at my shit. Um, I, like I won't give some of my sin number obviously, but you know, yeah. it's like, I don't mind if people saw like what I was looking at, you know? Sure. I, I guess like, like, I, like I, I don't think I for, like, you know, I, just don't, I don't want it to be caught in my, like uh, what was this? Like the autofill bar. Oh yeah. So that like oh, I'm hanging out with somebody one day and they're like, wait, what? what? Yeah, that, I guess that could be weird. But it's like my position would be like I'm not looking at anything weirder than most people. Like the I, I weirdest I am. No, I'm not saying you are. Yeah. I'm saying for me, it's just like if I'm looking at porn. I want to be clear. People probably think I'm doing like very. No, no, I, I don't think uh, yeah. you're doing that. I'm just saying my position is like if anyone looked saw like the type of porn that I'm watching, it's like it's pretty tame. Like most people watch that as well. You know, like and that's the crazy. I'd just shit rather not I be in a position with like someone where I have to explain to them like. What, I, what kind of porn I want. And that's you know? fair, but I'm saying I don't know if I'd have a problem with that because I'd like be like, w do you not watch any at all? And they'd be like, no, I do. And I'd be like, okay, is it like really, what is it? Like, is it like BBW or is it like, I don't know, some type of tame porn category. And it's like, it's probably that. And it's like, yeah, it's not that much different from what I'm doing. Is this really so weird for you? Fair enough, then. Yeah. I like my VPN, though. Yeah, no, it's like, I'm just saying. What's the difference between a state that attempts to redistribute to foster equality of opportunity and, and a command economy? Is it is it a difference of a degree? Like, are you looking at models let's say like the Scandinavian countries, or I wouldn't use Canada, by the way, because Canada is now, uh, what would you call, predicted predicted by economic analysis analysts to have the worst performing economy for the next four decades of all the developed world. So maybe we'll just leave the example of Canada. That's true. That's really unfortunate. <clears throat> Dude, I can't believe um, Trudeau is like ride or die for the carbon tax. Yeah, it's one of the worst policies I've ever you seen. You know, like carbon tax? No. Why not? It's regressive. What do you mean? It puts more of a burden on working people as opposed to uh, um, poorer people because they're gonna have to pay it. You mean? Yeah, I don't like regressive tax policies. Yeah, I like, like I don't like sales tax. That's also regressive. You know? Yeah, like the people who are gonna take them. Like everyone has to pay it, but like the poor people are gonna feel it the most. You mean? Exactly. Yeah. 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 I think that's fair. Canada off the table. Sure. Canada's just like people like the idea of carbon tax. You know? I don't but they don't. It seems like they don't. No, no. But like I don't think people like know like what it actually is. But I'm saying people like the idea of like some like. Someone who, and also he just doesn't have the fucking balls to own it. Like he was on the floor with Polly a couple of weeks ago, mm -hmm. and he was like, "It's like this this carb or Trudeau was like this carbon uh like dividend or something." And like all everyone starts laughing on the conservative side because yeah. they're like, "Dude, just say it's a fucking tax. Yeah, like, it's own it. Dividend. At least own it. Yeah, you know. Yeah, I like, agree. yeah. Scandinavian countries are often the polities that are pointed to by, I would say, by people who at least in part are putting forward a view of redistribution for purposes of equality of opportunity like you are, but they're a strange analogy because they're very small countries and up till now they were very ethnically homogenous. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. And that makes a big difference when you're trying to flatten out the redistribution. Uh, Plus they're also incredibly wealthy, climate, which makes, you know, redistribution, let's say a lot easier. So, 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 so what's, why, 
why doesn't a government that's bent on redistribution fall prey to the pitfalls of command economy and, and forced re- redistribution for that matter? How do you how do you protect against that? I think what you have to do is very, very, very difficult is people get very ideologically captured by both ends and they feel very, uh, I guess, like committed or they feel very allegiant to pushing certain forms of economic organization. And I think sometimes it blinds them to some of the benefits of what exists when you incorporate kind of multiple models or, I mean, you call them mixed economies, which is really what every capitalist economy today is. It's some form of free market capitalism combined with some form of like government intervention to control for negative externalities. These are the ways that all economies, even in Scandinavia and the world, work. And I think that recognizing the benefits of both systems are the okay. best way to, yeah, to okay, make okay. things work. Yeah. Fair enough. And, and the Scandinavian countries seem to have done a pretty good job mm-hmm. of that. But like I said, they have a simpler problem to solve, let's say, than sure. the Americans have. Negative externalities. Mm-hmm. That's a you know, that's an interesting rabbit hole to wander down because the problem I have with negative externalities, you made a case already that, and again, correct me if I've got this wrong, but I, I think I think that I understood what you said. Um, a free market, free exchange economy is a gigantic distributed computational device. Basically, yeah. Right, exactly. Which, funnily enough, one of the big problems for command economies is called the computation problem because no central body can actually compute, yes, you know, the that, that, of... Right, exactly. Mm-hmm. Right, that, that's not, yeah, that's that's a fatal problem, mm-hmm. right? Because it doesn't have the computational power. It certainly doesn't have the, the speed of data recognition. It doesn't have on, the on-the-ground agents if, if all of the perception and decision-making is centralized, right? It's mm-hmm. way too low resolution. It's going to crash. Okay, so, and I think that that's, comprehensible technically as well as ideologically all right so but these conversations though they make me realize that i need to do way more research into like economic models and all that stuff i feel like i haven't looked into any of that it's a good thing to think about you know yeah because that's like so important you know it's like a pretty big part of pretty much everything like every country i mean having said that with regards to externalities all the externalities that a market economy can't compute are so complex that they can't be determined centrally by the same argument. And there so, are ways to account for them, though. Really? That work with. Tell me. Yeah. How. So because I can't see that because mm-hmm. I can't see how that they they can be accounted for without the same computational problem immediately arising. Yeah, and I understand that. And I think that's a problem sometimes of uh, people very far on the left when they want to deal with certain problems. Uh, I think that they want to bring like heavy-handed, you know, like things like price controls in to say, well, we need less of this, so let's just make this cost this particular thing, which ironically enough introduces a whole other set of externalities that will happen when you get a lot of friction between where your price floor or ceiling is set compared to where market was set at. But ideally, if you're a reasonable person and you view economies as mixed economies, what you try to do is you try to take these externalities, meaning things that aren't accounted for with your primary system. So in a capitalist system, an externality- Do you understand what they're talking about? I'm not going to lie. The entire time I was watching that, I was just thinking, like, Destiny is, like, such a small person. <laughs> and, like, I wonder how many how like many more, jacket, how many like more people would respect him as a man if he was, like, six foot two and saying these same things. And how many people discredit what he says just because of, like, the soy boy nature. Dude, this guy came into work today. He comes in a lot. He's probably, like, six four. Mm-hmm. I just wonder what it would be like. To you know, be six four? Yeah. Well, probably feel you great. Just, you can just ask me. That, that, well, no, but you're, like, six three and three quarters yeah, or something, right? Yeah. Do you understand the externality thing they're talking about? I wasn't paying attention at all. That was the only thing oh, I was right. thinking about. I was also thinking about like, does he wear this jacket because his nipples poke out a little bit? <laughs> I'm like, I saw it. Let's keep rolling. I wasn't even paying attention. Probably might be something that causes a negative effect, but it doesn't cost you any money. Pollution would be a good example of that. And rather than saying like, well, no company can pollute this much, or you know, if you're a company, you have to use these things because we, the other things are making too much pollution. All you do is you say, okay, well, if we've determined that say carbon is bad for the atmosphere, we're just going to attach a little price to that. Okay, Government's going to say that yeah, if you pollute this much, here's the price, and then if you want to pay for it, you can. But that type of uh, intervention in the economy basically allows the free market to hopefully do its job because the government has tacked on a little bit of a price thing that tries to account for the cost of that externality. Yeah. Great. That's a great example. We can go right down that rabbit hole. Mm-hmm. Carbon. Okay. So first of all, um, yeah, we're going to skip here because this is where they talk about like climate. You don't find that interesting? I don't, but do you? I don't, <laughs> I find, I'm finding this pretty interesting. Okay. One of the things I've seen, you tell me what you think about this, something that I've seen that actually shocks me that I was interested in watching over the last five or six years. I wondered what would happen when the left, the progressives, ran into a conundrum. And the conundrum is quite straightforward. If you pursue carbon pricing and you make energy more expensive, then you hurt the poor. And I don't think you just hurt them. In fact, I know you don't. You just don't hurt them. I heard a man two days ago who's fed 350 million people in the course of his life, um, heading the UN's largest relief agency, make the claim quite straightforwardly that, that misappropriation on the part of interventionist governments increased the rate of absolute privation dramatically in in the world over the last four or five years. I'll be honest, no one no one I know personally can explain how climate change works. Mm-hmm. They make all these bold, I'm not saying it's a hoax. This is what make, do you mean how climate change works? Like, uh, no one, like if I asked you, is climate change happening? You'd say yes. And if I said, explain it to me, I feel like you do a pretty bad job at it. You, yeah. know? you want me to try that? Sure. I mean, I understand like the green. No, I'm not, I, I, I want to see if I even know it. 
Okay. Well, maybe I would give the answer that you already know, but you don't find that to be adequate. So then carry on. Okay. Yeah. But basically what I'm saying is like, uh, if we all don't really get it fully and if experts keep making predictions over and over again, that don't seem to be coming to fruition, like, I feel like our, our duty as a species is to take care of the people who are currently alive. I'm not inter- I feel like there's a, there is a, like a, um, you don't think there's a duty or at least like a secondary duty to like, no, I don't preserve like, the future race. I feel like there's sort of a, a subliminal message that goes along with a lot of uh, climate activism that, that endorses the idea that humanity ought to exist forever, you know? Mm-hmm. And like, listen, like if we didn't, if his point is like, but wait, you know, I'd fuck all that. Wait, so, but I, I don't. I kind of disagree with the, the idea that like, um, for trying to preserve like the planet for the future necessarily means that you're going to fuck up like poor people right now. I don't think that's true. So you just disagree with that premise? Yeah. If that premise were true, I think you can do both. I think you can like preserve the planet for the future and try to help out the poor at the same time. I think, that, I think those two can live together. Well, I haven't seen it yet. Well, maybe we just aren't doing a good enough job. Like, what What you think that, like, it's just not happening right now? Poor getting fucked over? Because it doesn't seem like we're doing either particularly effective right now. I just don't. I, if, I, if I we hate, keep, the, if we I hate keep the middle ground them, approach. Like, <clears throat> if we're going well, it's, to. It's only a middle ground approach. You, you know what it is, Rowan? Okay. Here's the thing. If we're going to pursue policy aggressive enough to actually stop climate change, yeah. a lot of people are going to get fucking hurt, you know? And if we don't do that, then the entire species might die. Yeah. And so. I think we should just pick one of those approaches and just do it because any middle ground is just going to lead to people getting hurt now and in the future. Or what if it just means that the future is not going to be a billion years. It's going to be 500 million and some people will get hurt right now instead of none. I mean, instead, instead of all of them, I just feel like if we can protect people, everyone now, let's just do that, you know? And if we really want to stop this problem, let's actually stop sure, it. Sure, and you, you know? might think that, but what about like all the people that want to be protected now, but also they want their kids to be protected in their grandchildren? It's just like we're well. not doing like a carbon tax. Like even if we did a carbon tax, like we're not doing nearly enough to prevent climate change. Yeah, at all, you know. Yeah, and so it's like I feel like we should just kind of give up and say fuck it, just and just die. be like, let's just like let's try to make his life as good as possible for everyone here for the next three, four hundred years, and yeah. then just kind of go out. Yeah. You know? I guess that'd be a real bummer for all the people that are like 10 and they're, that's all they got. Oh, fuck them. Yeah, fair enough. And, not, and that has happened not least because of carbon pricing, not just carbon pricing, but the insistence that carbon per se yeah, is an externality that okay. we should control. Now, okay, we're going to go to, uh, we're going to go to this one. I wonder if this line keeps going. Yeah, me too. Psychology of those who uttered there are too many people on the planet. Let's see that. Everything you've said is true. What do you think is the plan then? What is the goal? What is the drive? Like, the why, dr- push, why push obviously horrible ideas for the planet and the poor? That's a good question. That's well, a good question. Well, the question he's not going to be able to answer. <laughs> he says that a lot. That's a good question. Yeah. That's and I love the destiny. He's like, you're positive, yet, right? So what, what do you think is the driver goal? Well, I listen to what people say. Here's the most terrible thing they say. There are too many people on the planet. Okay, so who says that? I've heard people say that for 30 years. Perfectly ordinary, compassionate people. Well, there's too many people on the planet. And I think, well, for me, that's like hearing Satan himself take possession of their spine and, and move their mouth. Not answering the question at do you, all. Do you think he, like, understands how theatrical he is? Do you think he thinks it's weird? I don't think he thinks it's weird. I think, like, he's, it's been proven effective for him, right? So do you think he views what he's doing as a performer? Do, do you think he's a grifter? Like, this can't be how he lives his life, right? Like talking like this, um, or do you think it is? No, I think he probably lives his life like this. Okay, well then it's not. Then it's, no, it's, well, not, it's not about whether it's effective or not. Then, he right? could be wrong though. He could be, yeah, but he is wrong. Yeah, I just I find it so interesting how like fucking like well, wasn't there a section here called like he doesn't need to be a gr- he doesn't need to be a grifter. Yeah, he doesn't need to be a grifter. He could just be like it's just so over it, the Some top, of it could like, be performative, you know. That might yeah. just be what it is. I guess I just wonder if it's performative or it's just a really weird dude, you know. Um, probably a little bit of both. I don't think he's like a regular guy after he turns the camera off. He's like, the demons and the dogs, you have to watch out. And then after he's like, um, Halo 3 at 11. The accent goes away too. Yeah. <laughs> the Halo and the dogs. It's like, okay. A terrible accent, Ron. Who are these excess people that you're so concerned about? And exactly who has you're, to go and win? No, we'll have people comment who, who, who okay. All right. You go first. 
the left is creating a fundamental problem here. We we don't understand what's going on. That's the problem. You tell me why. Okay, let me see here. All right. See, the question that you even presented here. I, it's not good. I'm just not a good Jordan Peterson. He, he, he's like the Carl Towns of like political discourse. His voice changes all the time, you mean? Yeah, and it's just so high pitched, you know? It's like, okay, I have to get Kermit down. It's just like, hello. I can't do Kermit. Kermit's like, hello, hello. Uh, right? From the Muppets? Yeah, because that's I, what it sounds from. I couldn't even put it in my head what that sounds That's what like. I mean. I'm trying to do it. Um, that's what, that's where Peterson comes from? Really, the problem with... That's pretty good. Yeah? Yeah. See, the issue with the climate tax... No, I lost it. The issue... See, the issue with the climate tax is that everyone's understand. going to be fucked by it. And really, only some people want to be fucked by it. And that presents the question of who wants to be fucked? <laughs> and these liberals, they, they say, will you be fucked or will I? Well, how do you answer that? <laughs> how do you? He gets so mad a lot. I'm like, asshole, how do you answer that? What did he say earlier? He was like, yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> yes, so. Yeah. It, yeah. <laughs> yeah it and why? And how? And who's going to make that decision? And even if you don't, even if you're not consciously aiming at that, you are the one who uttered the words. You're the ones who muttered. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot how fucking ridiculous he looks, man. Are you drunk? No. Oh. Like I forgot they cut out and I forgot that he was he's wearing a pirate costume. Yeah. <laughs> it's pretty weird. The phrase, what makes you think that the thing that possessed you to make you utter that words isn't aiming at exactly what you just declared. That's and so like, I'm literally pretty saying. sure that I fought this guy in like Assassin's Creed 3. You know? Yeah. He looks like a character in Assassin's Creed. Yeah. I, de definitely the even what he's so saying. Like yeah, even the way that he's saying it. You know, that's a terrible vision. But when you look at what happens in genocidal societies, and they emerge fairly with fair regularity, and usually with a utopian vision at hand, the consequence is the mass destruction of millions of people. So why should I assume that something horrible isn't lurking? Back of the Declaration of Independence. National treasure? Carry on. What do you mean, the actual treasure? National treasure. What about it? You ever see that movie? Yeah. You know the plot? Yeah. Yeah. It would just be funny if, if he, he if you make yeah. There's an invisible pressure. So you're telling me the, the only funny the... part of it would be the fact that he'd be the one voicing. I would it love out. to see him just be in movies. It'd be hilarious. We're going to steal the Declaration of Independence. I I think he thinks that he is like uh, like a hero in in like human history. Yeah, and Moses is dead in the desert or something. Apparently. Yeah, thing like that right now, especially given that we have you know push. Also, everyone, you know what I would have titled this chapter. Uh, overpopulation debate. The psychology of those, those who, who dare to honor. There are too many people on the planet. That's Satan speaking from the depths of hell. <laughs> He's like, what did it? Perfectly compassionate people come up to me and say that. It's like, that's Satan speaking. <laughs> that's not John. I know, I know, Louise. <laughs> Eloise. It's not them in that moment. It's Satan. I heard, I heard someone once say we should have price controls on on carbon. That sounds like Lucifer raping a child in the depths of hell. Just, That's not you anymore, Carlos. <laughs> Carlos, what happened? We had dinner. Sense is taking your flesh. <laughs> I'm starting to lose it. I know you're it's just going yeah. crazy. A few hundred million people back in death. Yeah, I know. This is how he sounds. No, we're, we're yeah. really off, but it's yeah. absolute poverty when we were doing a pretty damn good job of getting rid of that. And I just don't understand what's happening in Germany or in the U. Who is he arguing with? Dude, he's getting so heated no, for no reason. Hey. Like it's in I'm talking to destiny, Satan's Satan's right hand. Insane. Like, look, man. He's just taking look, man. <laughs> look, man. If they would have Germany or in the UK, like it's in Wait, go back a little. What the fuck is he talking about? I don't even know what the fuck he's talking about. So why should I assume that something horrible isn't lurking like that right now? Especially given that we have pushed a few hundred million of people back into absolute poverty when we were doing a pretty damn good job of getting rid of that. And I just don't understand what's happening in Germany or in the UK. Like, it's insane. Like, look, man, if they would have look, got rid of the nuclear oh, plants they looked, man. <laughs> and made energy five times as expensive, and the consequence would have been they weren't burning lignite coal as a backup, and their unit production of energy, of pollution per unit of energy had plummeted, you could say, well, look, you know, we hurt a lot of poor people, but at least the air is cleaner. It's like, no, air is... I feel like if, if he came out and he was like, listen, like, <clears throat> this has all been performance art. Like I'm doing a character. Would you be like, yeah, it's kind of cool. 
not be like that's fucked up. You just like changed so many people, millions of people's minds. Everybody causes a school shooting or two. Yeah, it's worse, and everyone's poorer. So like, the, explain to me how the hell the left can be anti-nuclear. Okay, I don't understand it at all. Gotcha. All right. Gotcha. Um, dude, he's arguing with one of the people on like his like his Discord that are just unhinged. He's like, gotcha. This okay. is just it's not people talk. Like, yeah. yeah. This is something that I brought up earlier. I'm talking to Satan. I'm Satan. I'm talking like him. <laughs> earlier, that is concerning to me. Um, I feel like when people get political beliefs, I feel like what happens is what we think happens, what we'd hope happen is you have some moral or philosophical underpinning. And then it feels like destiny explains some things a lot. Well, okay. Maybe this is unfair. I've watched some Jordan, th Jordan Peterson things where he explains things really well, like ideas, theories, but it seems like Destiny's trying to like pull Jordan back in and saying like, this is what it seems like people do. Mm -hmm. And what's so bizarre to me about the Jordan thing is like, <clears throat> I understand grifting on a psychological level or like even in past like why someone would do it. Yeah. Like what like Crowder, or like Glenn Beck or Alex Jones would do. I get it. Cause it fits the narrative of the party. Right. Mm -hmm. And they adapt around it. I don't know who, who this is for. Like his rhetoric. Like it's not for like MAGA Trump people. This isn't maybe like pseudo intellectuals. Around. Maybe, but like, it's so like religious in nature that like all those people are atheists anyways. Well, a lot of people like it's not facts maybe, and logic. Maybe it's not maybe he's talking to more. Populism. He's maybe talking to more religious, more of the people that are more attuned to their religion. I don't know. Maybe maybe that's what he's doing. I don't know. He's veered more religious in like the later years. You but know? even still, it's not religious enough to, for, to make sense. You well, know? he's the best in the middle of the road kind of guy. Like he's just like never gives a firm stance. Always says like that's a good question. Can yeah. you answer? It? I just think it's so interesting that, the, that this market system we have. He's almost like a great example in himself against it because like the fact that we reward this, mm -hmm. you know, as an economy is good to watch. And from there, you combine this with some epistemic understanding. He said a lot of good things. I think that's why it's yeah. popular. I think, I just think there should be a price retarded. control on that. Like if you're going to watch Jordan Peterson, I think that you should have to pay like a one percent tax. <laughs> sure. Beginning of the world, and then you combine these two things. Well, you engage in really going to hurt the poor people. I don't think poor people watch Jordan Peterson. <laughs> Some you form of analysis. Some like yeah, coal miner in West Virginia who, who's like out of work and he's just like, he's, like, he's listening to Jordan. I, I don't know okay, what to do with my life. Wait, come on. I know. <laughs> so he's like doing this like coal mining. He's like mining and shit. And he watches like a Jordan Peterson video at, at lunch. And then after he comes, back, he comes back, he comes back and he's like, nonsense. You know what? Bill was actually sounding like that in the mines earlier today. <laughs> he is Satan. <laughs> Yeah. Your moral It'd be view, nice if that was you, true. Yeah, you start to apply like prescriptions. So yeah. maybe I'm religious. Maybe I analyze society and I see that uh, particular TV shows lead to premarital sex. So my societal prescription is we should ban these TV shows, right? Ideally, this is how you would imagine this process works. What I find happens, unfortunately, all too often is what people do is they join social groups. And then with those social groups, they inherit something that I call like a constellation of beliefs. And this constellation of beliefs, instead of rationally building on each of these, you basically get this like jenga tower that is like floating over a table oh, and every like, block is like supporting itself earlier today what i'm doing with anton theory like i would call this banal theory sure like that's the idea just but come you, up with a bunch but you of haven't given me anything yet though you had to give me a theory about people and then it'll be like that's anton theory yeah well you'll see it if you build it and you prop and you i got my day's it. theory what's that everyone gets their birthday what that mean like no matter how bad of a person you are i don't think anyone should come at you on your birthday because i think it makes sense everyone should get one day and I think as you accomplish things in life, you earn more of those days. Which does that mean you can like sexually assault someone on your birthday and that you can't get mad at them at that time, but tomorrow you can? Yeah. That's stupid. Yeah, I think immunity. I, mean, no yeah, I think that's a cool idea. That's absurd. That's like it's like that's the purge. So dumb. It's like the purge. I completely disagree. <laughs> that's Anton theory. Man. Anton theory is horrible. A real part of the tower can be it's addressed because you pull out one piece, it all falls apart. So right. People become like very stuck in all of this combined constellation stuff, and none of it is really given like any analysis and you can't really push anybody from, from one way or another uh, in, in terms of like reevaluating any of the beliefs that are part of this constellation. Um, I wish I would have. That's, that's fine. I wish that's I fine. My God. Sleep is the foundation. Well, it's helping to get a spear. Enjoy the time. Now of cognitive process. That's, that's, really that's fine. I wish that's I right. Have, well, you yeah. know, there are more. That's good. That's fine. That's right. Did he put that out over them talking? A little models bit. now of, sure. there are models now of cognitive processing, belief, belief, system, Oh, he's processing that make the technical yeah, claim the JP, that daily wire I, I didn't know that. Yeah. what a belief system does is constrain entropy check that's not okay. surprising at all okay yeah. so, and now now the signal for for released entropy which would be a consequence of say violated fundamental beliefs uh -huh. is a radical increase in anxiety right and a decrease in the possibility of positive emotion 
And so people will struggle very hard against that, which is exactly the phenomena that you're describing. Yeah. Okay. I agree with what you said. Although, so here's, here's my. Yeah. So I'm not sure why it's relevant to what, the issue I was I'm getting. I'm getting okay, I'm getting fine. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Here's, here's my issue. Okay. So <clears throat> when I'm trying to evaluate a situation, I like to think that I have some, uh, I've got some insulation from the effects of what liberals think or what conservatives think. Because on my platform, I don't necessarily have an allegiance to a particular political ideology. Like right now, I'm like center left to progressive, but I break really hard from progressive on certain issues. I think Kyle Rittenhouse is in the right. I think basically everything you guys are doing with indigenous people is insane, uh, including the complete mass grave hoax. Uh, I think that I'm a big supporter of the Second Amendment. Uh, I have beliefs where I can break from my side, you know, pretty hardcore because I am not like allegiant to certain political ideology. One thing that worries me with this constellation of beliefs thing is that sometimes when it comes to evaluating a particular policy or a particular problem, I feel like it's part of the constellation and sometimes it inhibits people from like taking a step back and reasonably thinking about the issue. So when we're talking about climate change, you mentioned the WEF sacrificing tons of people, the UN, global elites, uh, five times energy costs in Germany, uh, genocidal people, I feel like th this is part of like a whole thing where it's like, okay, well, let's take a quick step back and let's just like think rationally about this particular issue for one moment. Okay. Well, you asked me what the motivation for anti-poor policies might be. So that's why I was Well, I did, but, but I got all of those things before I even asked that question. Um, because I think it's totally possible that somebody might say, okay, well, when you put carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, it seems to cause an increase in surface temperatures. This has been happening from about the 1800s. And as we started to track surface temperatures, whether the thermometer is on top of the Empire State Building or in the middle of the field, it seems like there's an average rise in temperatures. And people all around the world are observing this in some places more than others. If you live in Seattle and 20 years ago, your apartment building wasn't built with air conditioner units, you feel that now. If you live in a place in London and you've never had an air conditioner before, now that's not acceptable. I think that people on the ground can see that there are changes. And I think that scientists, when they look in labs, can see changes. It might be that some models aren't precise enough. And it might be that for reasons we don't even understand. Well, the now. economic models they, certainly aren't precise enough. Sure, maybe, maybe that not might be maybe. true. Maybe, they can't even use them to predict the price of a single stock for six <laughs> months. The economic models are not sufficiently accurate to calculate out the consequences of climate change over a century. I, not in the when, least. When you, I, I like the comparison because economic models can't predict individual stocks, but they do predict the rough rise of the market. You invest in the S&P yeah, you get cataclysmic about cataclysmic collapse. Nope, even with the cataclysmic collapse accounted for, you're going to see about seven percent returns on average with inflation okay. over. I wouldn't call of time. an average a very sophisticated model analogous that's to fine, climate change. That's the difference between climate and weather, though. Right? It's that climate isn't going to tell you what the temperature is on a given day, but it might tell you the average surface temperature over a period of one year or 10 years. And then that's the difference between climate and weather. That's, well, that's between, like, the market hypothetical and difference. It is a hypothetical, but again, we're seeing more and more and more data every okay, single well, year. Okay, that so let, hotter, let's, hotter, let's, so jump, gonna, let's yeah. jump out of our cloud of presuppositions for a minute. Sure. Now, one of the things that... Oh, no, wait. I, I, oh, yeah, okay. I yeah, okay. want to say, yeah, there, are, there are some things that we've gotten as a result of investing in green energy that have been good. So, for instance, uh, the power of solar energy has dropped dramatically in the United States, faster than anybody thought possible, such that... Uh, uh, solar energy is like competitive or beating fossil fuels in certain areas. If, as long as you can set the solar panels up, you're literally beating yeah, fossil fuels. Yeah, and as long as the sun is shining. Well, it's, I mean, it still is. We're not a nuclear winter No, yet, no, so. but it isn't when it's cloudy. And it That's why I said depending on where you live. There are places, right. equatorial places, if you're trying to set up a solar panel in uh, in Seattle, you know, you might not have as much like in New York City. Or in Germany. Much, uh, or in Germany, true. Or, um, there also, Europe, I think or there, Canada. There are also other issues that are coming. Got him. <laughs> Dude, he's just trying to... Th he's actually well, destroying yeah, Destiny right now. No, he's, he's <clears> just being a fucking goober. Dude, I I, he seems like a compulsive liar in that, like, he just... Like isn't listening to anything Destiny's saying. Or, I know he's literally waiting. Like he's saying, yeah. like, which is very funny. He's saying, like, like solar like, panels have dropped. Have dropped in price. The comedy show. Solar, so solar panels have dropped in price. You should be like the Eric so now Andre it's proven this. to be more more effective if you for you to own solar panels than fossil fuels on average. And he's like, well, not if you're here. And it's like, well, yes, obviously it's different depending on the on the weather that your that your city uh, typically has, of course. Yeah. But he's like, that's not that's not breaking the point though. Well, because he he can never say that. Yeah. I know he can't say that. He yeah. has to say, well, not in Canada, and not in Germany, and not in Europe. Yeah. And it's like, well, yeah, I guess maybe not in those places. But I'm not saying that it's good. It's going to be good everywhere. I mean, uh, that I think are obfuscating our ability to evaluate what's being caused by green energy versus not. When we look at energy increases in Germany, um, I think there's a similar constellation around nuclear energy, for instance. People don't want nuclear energy because they think of nukes, and they think of nuclear meltdowns, and they think of Chernobyl, and they think of Fukushima, and they think of atomic bombs, and that's it. And that's stupid. And I agree with you. But nuclear energy is a totally viable alternative to other forms of... Then why does the radical left oppose it? You think it's just this... Why does the radical left oppose it? Yeah. Destiny's a rad radical left. Well, why are you yeah, even talking like he about that right now? shouldn't have to answer for shit that he doesn't agree with. Yeah, why are you... you know? Yeah. Now, see you for the, same, for, the same, for the same reason the, the right opposes vaccines because it sounds scary and it's a big thing and they don't trust it. it well, the right has a reason to distrust vaccines in the aftermath of the COVID de debacle. Well, because, well, then don't that's people, the exact don't same people, thing. Don't that's people the exact have the right same to fucking point he just that's made. So stupid. But, that's, it's exactly the same thing. It's, it's, it's irrational. Thing. They're because of Chernobyl and Fukushima. More afraid of it. It's not logical. I'm going to apply to everything. Yeah, it's the exact same thing with saying. I would get vaccines because of how COVID Except is handled. In one, you're politically, you have political allegiance to them, so you have to yeah. say, "Well, no, they they do think that for a good reason." And also, you're completely wrong if you think vaccines are harmful to people. You know, there's some people, very rare, that have yeah. certain disorders that it will affect. Just like but nuclear, like meltdowns. Even if I stipulate that. 
you know, that say COVID vaccines were horrible for people, which is not true at all. To be clear, research it. It's not true. Um, but even to, if I were to stipulate that, which I have no reason to do, mm-hmm. that's not a reason to throw out all of vaccines. In the same way, Chernobyl isn't a reason to yeah, throw out all of nuclear energy. Maybe COVID vaccines, if it, they were harmful, but not all vaccines. Yeah, of course it's not. insane. Because they were imposed by force. And that was a very You get to choose if you have a nuclear power plant? That's imposed by force too, no? You don't get to choose where your energy comes from if you live in a country. You just you turn the light switch and hopefully you don't have a Chernobyl that melts down in your particular town, right? Well, you get to choose it because you can buy it or not. Well, That's I mean, a choice. It's a, but it, the nobody negative, had a choice with the vaccines. Nobody had a choice whether or not they lived near Chernobyl or not. Nobody had a choice. Sure, they can, a they can move plant. away. Well, I don't know. Well, 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 you fucking idiot. I'm trying to solve the murders of three young girls. We're now actively trying to find a serial. Oh, like five. Not going to lie, Miles, you sound a lot like Satan. Oh, my. Is you? No, I'm just making a joke. He sounds like Satan. 100 miles. That's like telling conservatives when uh, Biden tried to do okay, the OSHA no, mandate for vaccines, no, like, well, you just get a different job, I, right? I don't want to debate about whether or not large nuclear power plants are mm-hmm. frightening. They are. Sure. Okay. And there are technologies now where that's not a problem. Mm-hmm. So, so and, and I think I don't, I think that's I a place like, for our discussion okay. to go because mm-hmm. I also understand why people are afraid of it. But what I don't understand, for example, is why the Germans shut down their nuclear power plants and the Californians are thinking and have doing mm-hmm. the same thing when they have to import power from France anyways. Like it's completely what you looked at and thought, thought it said Levent. That's what my friend Levent. Yeah. Or Levent. burn coal, which is a million well, times worse. Not yeah. just coal. Mm-hmm. Lignite. Yeah. Right. Yeah. right. And then with yeah. regards to. No. Maybe. No idea. Or just like rich douchebag. Not rich douchebag either. No. Oh. Like not him. Just like his parents. Like. Uh, I have no idea how wealthy his parents it's are. It's not a name. Levent? Yeah. <laughs> well, it's just not a name as much as anything isn't a name. I would say that I've never met or even read or ever heard of that. So Okay, well, I bet that people from, like, Nigeria have never heard of a guy named, like, like Zach. Really? <laughs> well, maybe they have, but you know what I mean, though. Like, it's only a name because it's common. Yeah, apparently, you know what, uh, in Nigeria, like, Azubiki is, like, Smith. Well, yeah. there you go. Yeah. To these renewable power sources, they have a very, they have a number of problems. One is they're not energy. I don't care about this anymore. God, this is so good, though, man. Oh, yeah, it is good. They're not energy dense. They require tremendous no, infrastructure no, 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 to produce. They're, they might be renewable at the energy level, but they're not renewable at the raw materials level. So that's a complete bloody lie. They're insanely sure, variable sure. in their power yeah, production. Sure. And because of that, you have to have a backup system. And the backup system has to be reliable without variability. And that means if you have a renewable grid, you have to have a parallel fossil fuel or coal grid to back it up. With- I could be completely wrong, but is solar and hydro or, or and hydro, I believe it's what it's called. I, I don't are those not much, renewable? I don't know much about energy. I, well, those are renewable. That's yeah. But I don't know much. And much solar? About is solar not renewable? Pretty um, sure it is. Like um, nuclear isn't I mean, by that. You nu- nuclear, I guess, can't because you have to mine. Infinite power supply. You have to mine for the uranium. But yeah, the hydro is definitely renewable. Yeah, because I mean, water, water. Think about it, right? Where like no water never goes away. Right? Yeah. Yes. Like it gets either gets consumed by beings and then they pee it out. It goes into the soil. They die eventually. It evaporates back. Yeah. Out. Like it, it. That's why it's a cycle. You know. Yeah. And the sun doesn't shine and the wind doesn't blow, which is unfortunately very very frequently. And so, again, and so and I'm not going to say there's no place for renewable energy like solar and wind. Imagine if Destiny tried to do the same gotchas that Jordan just did. He's like, he said, wind doesn't always, wind doesn't always uh, blow and sun doesn't always shine. And then Destiny was like, well, you ever been to Arizona? You ever been to LA? Like, yeah, that's not the point I'm trying to make, though. Because maybe there are specific niche locales where those are useful, but the logical... He's like, ah, what would you say? Antidote to the problem of reliability, if we're concerned about carbon, but we're really not, would be to use nuclear. And the Greens haven't been like flying their bloody flags for 30 years saying, well, we could use fossil fuels for fertilizer and feed people, and we could do use nuclear power to drive energy costs down in a carbon dioxide free manner. That seems pretty bloody self-evident to me. And so then it brings up this other mystery that we were talking about earlier. You know, what's the impetus behind all this? Because the cover story is, oh, we care about carbon dioxide, which I don't think they do. Uh, he, he, he was the voice he just did with that. Of Jordan Peterson. Yeah, and it was actually, it was just as good as ours. So when he's imitating leftists, he's, so we're doing an imitation of Jordan Peterson imitating leftists. Yeah. I'll take it. Essentially. Especially given the willingness to sacrifice the poor. It's pretty good. It makes no sense to me. And I think it's relevant to the issue you brought up, which is that people have these constellations of ideas and there's a driving force in the midst of them, so to speak. They're not necessarily aware of what that driving force is. So wait, isn't it more likely that people are... Just the fact that he goes on this rant and then he says, I think this is relevant. It shows that like he's not responding. He just is like ranting and then he's like, but the, the, the thing I, I just said, that, that applies. Yeah, you know? exactly. Like 
And Destiny would be like, yeah, I agree. Which Let would me, make nah, sense I agree. if I knew what audience he was this pitching is, this to. Is but what, it seems like this he's is literally the, crazy. This is how the conversation goes. Jordan lays out like a like a uh, an idea. Destiny says, I agree pretty much with the, I agree with a lot of that. And then let me ask you this question about this. And then gives another idea, but doesn't answer the question yeah. directly, at least. Either misinformed or misguided, then people are legitimately trying to depopulate the planet. I'm look, misinformed and, and ignorant. We're talking about a guy here who couldn't make main Daily Wire. This is clearly Daily Wire Plus. I guess that's another edition of this, of like other guess, content. Maybe. This is a guy who is not able to make the Daily Wire main stage. I actually we're, I don't we're, think that's true. To be fair, I think... every week Michael Knowles and Dave Rubin pretend they read books that they didn't read and do a book club. Have you ever seen that? To be fair, I, that. I agree with that, but I'm pretty sure DW Plus is just like their streaming service. Like Disney Plus is a streaming service. Oh, okay. I yeah. didn't realize that. Wait, so wait. I don't want to take away from your joke. But he's yeah. streaming this? It's just, it's going to go then on. Then why is it also platform. on YouTube? <laughs> it's going to go on a streaming platform, not streaming, like live streaming. I understand that, but I, should, I, I would imagine if they create that, there's got to be a paywall. Oh yeah, I don't so, know. Maybe no, it might just be a. It would watermark. be like if the Mandalorian was just like also on YouTube. I know it, it, that's funny, but it would be just. I imagine it's just like a watermark that they want there, so like people think more about Daily Wire. That's almost even dumber. Not really. It'd be hilarious if, you, if it wasn't. Well, no, because it's like there are just, there, there is paywalled them. content, but also I want people to know about Daily Wire more, so then people are more likely to go to the Daily Wire. So paywall. like this show has other content. Yeah, I probably. That, yeah. Well, yeah. The, yeah, the Jordan Peterson show, I guess, yeah. That's, pl that's plenty relevant and worth considering. And stupidity is always a better explanation than malevolence. But malevolence is also an explanation. And no, I don't think it's a better explanation because... Why would we waste so much money sending food aid, having Bush do, uh, you know, programs through Africa for AIDS, having other billionaires like Bill Gates invest so much money in anti-malarial stuff? Like, why would all the global elites be so invested in helping and killing the people here at the same time? Well, some, okay, well, some of it's confusion. Okay. You know, and some of it's the fact, you know, many things can be happening simultaneously with a fair bit of internal paradox because people just don't know which way is up. For example, I could be wearing this yeah, One no, Piece you're, 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 anime cosplay and also be talking about how the devil's inside of you. Exactly. Many things can happen. And they're happening right now. We can have no Often. clear energy and I could be really mad about um, nothing while talking about Satan. <laughs> Look at my pirate. The, what is this thing he's wearing? Man? I, is that Egyptian? I don't know. I, it's so weird. You got like this, this it is comic weird. sans ass skull and crossbones across. Upside down cross. This, no this lady... Some sort of text, like I would. This is something I'd imagine, like, like an NBA player would wear, like in the like tunnel pictures. You yeah, know? like I can see, I can see Tatum wearing this. Yeah. I'd never thought Jordan, Jordan Peterson would be wearing, wearing yeah. this. But the problem with the argument, okay, so so you you tell me what you think about this. Uh -huh. So it you have to be there. But the problem with the argument, okay, so so you you. Tell and we're on one point five. Tell me, please, <laughs> give me your answers. You need to know. I have so many questions I can never answer them. <laughs> Dude, the forties, please subscribe to Daily Dude, Wire Plus. If we were like, please don't watch us for free on YouTube. Please, I need money. We fucked up so bad. We weren't supposed to post these for free. All of these are supposed to be Daily Wire Plus premiums, please. But I keep putting it to the wrong channel. You have to watch Lady Ballers. <laughs> Lady Ballers is so good. I'm going to be on Matt Walsh next week. Please watch it and pay us. Don't, you can either watch it for you or for money. But preferably do pay. We'll allow both. Oh my God, dude. Everyone in the apartment must fucking hate us. Right but dude, imagine like people took a freeze frame of this. Like, you know, like they took that one freeze frame of the woman going like, like really mad, yeah. And like they put it on Twitter. Imagine we did this of Jordan Peterson. It was like he's like pandering and like he's he's apologizing well, to like there's a, people. a thing on Destiny subreddit. Well, they'll, they'll take pictures of like him and Lex and like like everyone in a circle. Like they'll take freeze frames. It'll be like who's getting the best head in this picture. Oh yeah, this would be a good one for Jordan. <laughs> yeah, he's 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 like oh. he's all he's trying to offer the best. Head. Although I don't think I've ever no, he's made that offer. position while getting. It. Well, he's not getting it. He's trying to say. Oh. He's trying to say here. Yeah. Let me give it to you, please. But then he's not even looking up. Please tell me what you think about this. <laughs> Austin, but the problem with the argument. Okay, so, so you, you tell me what you think about this. This is he has to do a mid mid debate pray. Just say just say consistent. Dude, I would imagine if you were silent for just like four minutes. That'd be hilarious. And Destiny's just like progressively like, what what are you doing, man? That'd be really funny. Like, I think he should just merge this into comedy. What are you doing there, young man? Do you want to hear my carbon tax solution?
It involves you being blown by me, a man in One Piece anime cosplay. Oh, I keep saying anime anime. I, I've never seen One Piece. I don't know what it is. That felt good. Uh -huh. So, you know, Hitler's cover story was that he wanted to make the glorious what? Third Reich and elevate the Germans to the Why are highest... you talking about Hitler? Dude, I honestly might pay for the show. Like, this is a great show. Possible status for the longest possible period of time. Okay, but that wasn't the outcome. The outcome was that Hitler shot himself through the head after he married his wife, who died from poison. Yeah, that's why he did it. <laughs> Hitler shot himself after he married his wife. Well, that's the whole story. What the fuck is he talking about? I, that's... This is the face of someone who doesn't know what he's talking about. He's about to go, <laughs> Hitler shot himself like he married I, his honestly, wife. I think this guy has mental issues. Like, he went to a, a institution, right, like, a couple of years back. And got a hair transplant. And then, like, what changed out of that? He's just back and he's crazier. <laughs> yeah. Is in the same day, in a bunker underneath Berlin, while Europe was in flames, while he was insisting that the Germans deserved exactly what they got because they weren't the noble people he thought they were. And then you might say, well, Hitler's plans collapsed in flames, and wasn't that a catastrophe? Or you could say, that was exactly what he was aiming for from the beginning, because he was brutally resentful and miserable. So, right? Who are you arguing with? Also, what the fuck? What is happening here? We, are we still talking about nuclear energy? <laughs> No, we're talking about is it malevolence or ignorance that drives bad ideas? Okay. Motives, motives versus public perception. How the fuck did he get here? No idea. Right from the time he was, you know, a rejected artist at the age of 16. And so he was working or something was working within him and something that might well be regarded as demonic, whose end goal was precisely what it attained, which was the devastation of hundreds of millions of people and Europe left in a smoking ruin. And the cover story was the Grand Third Reich. And so there's no reason at all to assume. I'm really excited. I'm not that's able to follow. Words. Yeah. Assume that we're not in exactly the same situation right now. I think that's a great reason to assume. I think that Hitler's motives and everything that he was trying to do wasn't a secret. I, like, I don't think that anybody had to guess that he was incredibly anti-Semitic, that secret, his Aryan supremacy was going to lead to the destruction and the murder of like so many different people in concentration. Like, none of this was a secret. It's not like he was hiding it. Um, he didn't extent, I mean, like, he, well, he tried to all, maybe hide the death camps, but nobody in Germany was wondering, like, wow, crazy the pogroms are happening as Jewish people. That's so crazy. Or wow, they're all being shipped to just mainly the Jews to camps to work. Like, that's kind of interesting. Or wow, he talks about this a lot in mind. Conf, but maybe it's just a coincidence. Uh, I don't think you can compare like Hitler to people that are worried about climate change. The worry that I Why have not? here is because if we're applying this. People, what are you talking about? Thought hit, people in Germany thought Hitler was perfectly motivated by the highest of benevolent. Uh, if benevolent I were, if I were to take this standard of evidence and apply this lens of analysis, couldn't I say the exact same thing about the conservative constellation of belief? They don't want to intervene anywhere in the world because they don't care about the problems there. Uh, they're anti immigration because they hate brown people. Trump wanted to ban Muslims from coming to the United States because he's xenophobic. Uh, conservatives uh, don't want to have taxes to help the poor because they want homeless people to starve and, and die in the winter. Uh, but like, I feel like if I. Some if, of that's true. And yes, you can adopt that criticism. I think the difference with regards, especially to the libertarian side of the conservative enterprise, but also to some degree to the conservative enterprise, is they're, they're not building a central gigantic organization to put forward this particular utopian claim. And so even if the conservatives are as morally addled as the leftists, and to some degree that might be true, they're not organized with the same gigantism in mind. And so they're not as dangerous at the moment. Now, they could well be, and they have been in the past, but at the moment, they're not. And so, of course, you can be skeptical about about people's motivations when they're brandishing how can we the moral say, flag. How would we? Why would we say that they're not as concerned about the gigantism? I feel like everybody is when it's particularly well, that they care about. You mean if whether they would be inclined in that direction? For sure, that conservatives wield the power of the government whenever they feel they need to, just as liberals do, right? Conservatives were very happy to well, see, that, for instance, abortion okay. was brought back as a look, state that's a, look, that's a good, that's a good objection. I think that you're correct in your assumption that once people identify a core area of concern. They're going to be motivated to seek power to implement that concern. I think cancel culture is a good idea too. I think conservatives uh, prior to the 2000s, if they could censor everything related to either LGBT stuff or weird musical stuff or stuff that they didn't want the kids to watch, conservatives would do it. But now that you see that like liberals and progressives are kind of wielding that corporate hammer, now conservatives are very much, well, hold on, we need freedom of speech, we need a platform for everybody. And now progressives are like, well, hold on, maybe we shouldn't platform people. I got, okay, I like, got no disagreement with mm -hmm. those things that you said. And I have no disagreement about your proposition that people will seek power to impose their, their, central, their central doctrine. Okay, so then you might say, and so we can have a very serious conversation about that. What do we have that ameliorates that tendency? In the well, United so, States, we've got a de uh, hopefully a form of decentralized government. I can't speak to Canada as much, but yes, ex well, yeah. yes, that's that's true. So that's one of the institutional protections against that, because mm -hmm. what that does is put various forms of power striving in conflict with one another, mm -hmm. right? And so that's a very intelligent solution. But then there are psychological and philosophical solutions as well, and one of them might be that you abjure the use of power, right, as a principle. And so, the, and this is one of the things that was done very badly during the COVID no, no, era, let's no, say, no, no, because the rule should, the fact that this, and one of them, you were talking about like the, who's getting ahead might be that you abjure the use of power, right? As a principle. And so, the, and this is one of the things that was done very badly during the COVID era, let's say, because the rule should be something like 
put various, then there are psychological and philosophical solutions as well. And one of them might be that you abjure the use of power, right? As a principle. Whatever. No. It was like, is that, I was going to make the joke. It's like, he's got, he just got like a little bit of head <laughs> just here. And one of them might be, oh, I, yeah, I, I, then there are psychological okay. in conflict with one another, mm -hmm. right? And so that's a very intelligent solution. But then there are psychological and philosophical a solutions as well. And one of them might be that you abjure the use of power, right? As a principle. And so the their system set up to remove, to put into conflict the use of teeth and throating. What the? Oh, These systems are important to protect against. I just nothing with him is like, why is he mad about? Like, it seems like he's just mad all the time about everything. Yeah, he is pretty mad. Just calm the fuck down, bro. Bro, does need to chill. And this is one of the things that was done very badly during the COVID era. I'd say 50, he's 65. Six. I'd say 57. I'd say six. I bet he's in the 60s. I bet he's late 50s. Let's see what he up the camera after. Let's see what he is. He is 61, right, between what we said. 61. Or let's say, because the rule should be something like, you it. don't get to impose your solution on people <laughs> using, using compulsion and force. There's a doctrine there, which is any policy that requires compulsion and force is to be looked upon with extreme skepticism. Now, compulsion. it's tricky because now and then you have to deal with psychopaths and they tend not to respond to, any to deal with psychopaths. anything but force. And so there's an exception there that always has to be made, and it's a very tricky exception. But look, let, let me let me tell you a story, and you tell me what you think about <laughs> after all this thing. He's queuing up, right? It's, because I think it's it's very relevant to the concern that you just you just expressed, and I I don't believe that the conservatives are necessarily any less it's going to get tempted okay. by the by the calling of power than the leftists. It's That's it's going to vary. More steady. From situation to situation, though I would say probably overall in the 20th century, the leftists have the worst record in terms of sheer numbers of people killed. So I mean, it depends oh, on how we're quantifying. Not that, really. Think, but okay, yeah, we'll I just mean, quantify sure. Mao. How's that? Direct death of 100 million people. So you know that's a pretty stark fact. And if we're going to argue about that, well, then we're really not going to get anywhere. So and I'm you, not disagreeing that the Holodomor happened as well. The Soviet Union and the and yes, China were horrible. I mean, I'm not going to. Yeah, I'm not going to. Yeah, okay, well, yeah, of course. It's yeah. a war of. You know, I'm just saying it, for what we're to it doesn't how much you attribute the war does to Nazi Germany, et cetera, et cetera. But but sure, like largely speaking, I, I don't think that the left beat the right uh, because the right wasn't trying. I don't think it's because Hitler's lack of trying led him to kill less people than what who ended up dying during the Great Leap Forward or during the industrialization. Of the yes, well, I also think it's an open question still to what degree Hitler's policies were right wing versus left wing, and no one's done the analysis properly yet to determine that. Well, what do we consider? Because it was a national socialist movement for a reason. And the socialist part of it wasn't accidental. Well, but the so I mean, there was no, uh, you know, cooperatively formed businesses that were owned by all of the people for the people and distributed to the people. And I don't think redistribution was high on Hitler's list of That's things true. to do. For, That's true. Yeah. It was but a strange mix that, of, sure. of well, but totalitarian also, politics. I don't think it was a strange mix. I think it was a bid to appeal to uh, mid left and center left, the KPD and the German Socialist Party by calling themselves National Socialists. I think it was very much like an authoritarian, ultra nationalist regime that pretty squarely fits with. Uh, people get mad if you call something far right or far left because they have a. An, an well, you know, terms, one but, of the things I would have done if I would have been able to hang on to my professorship at the University of Toronto would have been to ex extract out a random sample of Nazi policies and strip them of, of markers of their origin and present them to a set of people with conservative or, or leftist beliefs. And I want to murder all of the Jews. Does this strike you as liberal or fascist? What if you throw it at them today? What? What if you threw that question? Oh, right actually, now? yeah, that's not, not a bad point. I think that's his point, right? But I mean, basically my understanding fundamentally of left, right, is just do you want hierarchies or do you not want hierarchies? The more hierarchies you want, the more right wing you are, and the less hierarchies you want, the more left wing you are. And I know a lot of conservatives are well, libertarian. Um, or it can see who it just be of both I, the left and right. Yeah, I mean there are. I or think, is I, libertarian off of the? I feel like it's a different axis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Agreed with them more, and that analysis has never been done, as far as I know. So we actually don't know, and we could know if the social scientists would do their bloody job, which we don't know, and we could know, and we should know. And we, well, we won't will know because we can't ever answer a question, but we should. They don't, generally speaking. That's something we could know. We could probably use the AI systems we have now, the large language models, to determine to what degree left and right beliefs intermingled in the rise of national socialism. So that's all technically possible. So, and it hasn't been done. So it's a matter of opinion. Sure. So, but, I, I don't necessarily disagree. Um, but that, that's something you could do. Okay. Guess, so I was going to tell yeah, you the yes, story. Yes, okay. Well, this has to do with the use of power. So um, I spent the time. Oh. At, uh, with a group of scholars putting and analyzing the Exodus story in Exodus seminar recently. And so the Exodus story is a very interesting story because it's a, it's a, what would you say? It's an analysis of the central 
the central tendency of movement away oh, from yeah, tyranny yeah. and slavery. Yeah. That's a good way. Yeah. Okay, we're going to go, what do we have? Living in separate realities and bring, in bridging the divide. mRNA oh, validity. I don't care about that, about that at all. It wasn't just left. We're weighing the fear of a crisis against the use of experimental technology. Yeah. Mass consensus. <coughs> okay. Why don't we start with mass consensus and see what that is? And Remarkable 2 is a paper tablet no, that feels no. like you're writing on paper and unlike the glass. No huge institution. What do you make of the excess deaths? You haven't come up with a bloody hypothesis. I don't even know. <laughs> You're at a bad time. Oh, if there are 20%. What do you think of the excess deaths? Or the mass. At the excess deaths in Europe right now. If I had to guess off the top of my head, it's going to be, like you said, one might be lingering effects of an overwhelmed healthcare system. Another one might be uh, deaths related to the war in Ukraine. Another one might be rising energy costs. That but it's absolutely for a couple impossible that any of it could be unintended consequences of a novel technology injected into billions of people. I think that if excess, first of all, there aren't billions of people in Europe. So if there were excess there deaths, were. I, mean, I understand, but you're talking about excess deaths in Europe. I'm not aware of excess deaths that exist in other places that are completely and totally unaccounted for where the only explanation would be the vaccine. I think well, if there were, I think more people would be talking about it. Well, we have to, well, first of all, the number of people talking about something is not an indication of the scientific validity of a claim. Quite I agree with that, but for well, a vaccine, then why are you using mass consensus as a as the determinant of what constitutes because truth? Because I think for That's something never been the case. Because I think for something well, that we, you think he I would, agree with Peterson on. That. Yeah, but how much how much do you think he would veer off like the like the the feeling of like the mass consensus of like Donald Trump didn't lose the election in 2020? Like how much how much do you think he would disagree with that? Do you think he would ever say Donald Trump did lose the election? I don't know what his view on. I've never heard him talk about. But that. I just mean that's like a mass consensus issue. I don't think he. This is just another. This is more of a point at principled things. I don't think he has an issue with mass mass consensus. He has an issue with mass consensus if it doesn't help him. Um, yeah, I think, and I think a great way to view that would probably be like he probably ap appeals to um, common sense a lot and stuff like that. And like, if you appeal to common sense, that that is literally common sense is so stupid. It, it's no, like that you're saying the same thing. That, that is mass consensus. Yeah. It's, it's a different way of saying it, basically. Common sense. Yeah. Most think most people think this is logical. Be... Well, like, like I it, just I don't like but, the idea of common sense. Like he said it doesn't make sense for because I know he's he's against a gay adoption, for example, right? I don't know if he had studies on that or he was probably he was probably like just religious. Yeah, or or even stupider, like, well, you know, people logically think like. Uh, it, a, a child needs a mother and a father like this is what everyone knows like that that's a form of saying mass consensus yeah, you yeah. Know, when you appeal to that kind of stuff yeah and he's okay with it in that instance yeah so I, I, it was given to billions and billions of people if this was something that would have a measurable effect on people it would be i've never seen destiny look more reasonable in a conversation in my entire this life this is what he does just though. in con in contrast well you know? in, to the craziness that someone's yeah. presenting yeah. with yeah it's like that's why he this is how he was with ben shapiro this is how he was with Can candace owens this is how no he but like ben shapiro, shapiro is a million times more sentient no, than how Peterson's coming. I out totally right agree, now. and that's why, like, he he's insanely tame for like the claims that Jordan Peterson makes. Um, but like, he tried to do with Candace Owens, and like immediately when he did that, like Candace like was like, "Are you just trying to be a contrarian?" Like, Destiny wants to be able to keep talking to these yeah, figures, no, but was, if he's too crazy and like too pushback, then they won't do it. Candace was really stupid too in her thing with him, but at least I can understand that she's grifting. You know, I just don't know what the fuck this is. You don't know who, yeah, no one knows what he is. Like, I just don't understand it. Yeah, that's fair. It would be impossible to cover it up or ignore it. Well, we wouldn't you, have to look at the one case right. brought up on a, on a documentary. We'd have to look at the one thing being talked about. And what do you, you know, make of the VAERS data? The VAERS There's more negative side effects reported from the mRNA vaccines than there were reported for every single vaccine ever created since the dawn of time. And not by a small margin. So it's not just the excess deaths. I agree. It's the VAERS data. What is VAERS data? It's the data base that until the COVID-19 pandemic emerged and we had the unfortunate consequence that there were so many side effects being reported, it was the gold standard for determining whether or not vaccines were safe. And that, that is not true. Do you know about what VAERS data is? Is VAERS data not just like an open... I don't know what it is. What it is. Uh, my understanding is VAERS, um, like, VAERS data was like the compilation of people... Is it like an organization? What is VAERS? Um, I don't know what it stands for, but it, my understanding is that like the VAERS website or whatever it is, I don't know what it stands for, is you could go submit like a... Um, oh, I remember when people were talking you about You could this. submit a story and like give your symptoms about the vaccine. They aren't going to be true necessarily. Like they aren't like vetted and to make sure like the validity of the claims are accurate, but anyone could put anything on there like and say, these are my symptoms from it. You know, so it's not a measure of like how bad the vaccines are because you could put whatever you wanted on there. It was just like kind of a good way to gauge the public, um, 
reaction to the to the vaccine. Now, as soon as it started to misbehave on the mRNA uh, vaccine front, we decided that we were going to doubt the validity of the VAERS reporting system. Okay, the VAERS reporting system is never the gold center for anything. VAERS reporting system is just going to report that there is some issue that you have after getting a vaccine. Yeah. That's it. I think it's vaccine, vaccine adverse. What the hell do you think it was set up for? To, to report adverse events Why? that happen after a vaccine. Why? To track and see if something was related to the vaccine. Right. right. So Why? Most Why? Why? Why did they do that? people, most people didn't even know VAERS existed until after the COVID vaccine. Once people know that it exists, of course, more people are, are going to engage with it. But what happens? So it's all noise. No, it, well, it could be or couldn't be. So what do you do when a bunch of stuff? Well, you, first of all, might, you so might begin by it, suggesting that maybe it's not all noise. Correct. So when Especially all of these the things are admitted to VAERS, what they do is from there, they investigate. All you can do, all of their, all VAERS is, is I might go and get a vaccine and maybe in three days ago, hmm, I got a headache. I'm going to go ahead and like call my doctor and, and make this report. And they'll say, okay, well, it's an adverse event after vaccine. Doesn't mean the vaccine caused the headache. And now that more people know about this than ever. I'm, sure, saying I'm just saying that theirs is not the gold standard of determining if it's actually working or not. What? Compared to actual uh, yeah. longitudinal perspective, randomized control trials. You mean like the ones they should have done to the goddamn vaccine? Like the ones become... that they did do for the vaccine oh, and they oh, continue yes. to do this day. Yes, that is correct. Yeah. They, yes, you really correct. think that you're in a position to evaluate the scientific credibility of the trials for the vaccines, do you? Really? No, I don't. So I have to trust. Then what are you what doing? I, have to do, what I, have, I don't trust. I have to trust the blood data. First of all, you have to trust third parties to some extent. When you go outside, I don't have to trust. Of course you do. You do every day. When you turn the keys in your car, you hope your engine doesn't explode. When you're drinking water, you hope that the public water or whatever tap or bottle water you got it out of isn't contaminated or poison with cholera. I don't when do you that as a consequence of consensus. No, you, you, of course you do. No, I don't. I do that as a consequence of observing multiple times that when I put the goddamn key in the ignition, the truck started. Why? You yeah, no, but every time he does that, he has to have faith that it's not going to blow up. I think the water thing makes a lot more. I, I, for another example, well, it's like every time I start my car, like you I'm go assuming a, that it's going to work because I have faith in people sure. that created it. He could be saying, it, "Well, no," but I think I think Peterson's right when he says, "I trust that because I've done it so many times and seen the effect." But yeah, but I, I, but I also think he trusted it. Like, like, if you go to a restaurant you've never been to before, you assume the food the food is isn't poisoned. Yeah, that's not because of experience. That's because, that's because of. Um, it's because of a third party trust. In third party, yeah. And I think that applies. To when them. you look online to see what the weather, I mean, there's so many millions. Yeah, of it's just not true. Like, yeah. yeah. It's you know what's going to start the 50th yeah. to the 100th time. Why do you, how many times do you wear those? With me. You I'm know not perfectly playing well you. Why. You don't know if the denim in those jeans isn't leaking into your bloodstream. To some extent, we trust, we have to trust third party institutions Except to make determination. When they use force. How about Especially that? When they use force, we trust the police officers. That? We trust the we judicial do, systems. We do. We do. We on the left trust the police. Do to we? some extent, do we? If somebody's breaking That's into your house, who do you call? Them. I'm not. I'm not a defunder. But if somebody's breaking into your house, you can be the most defund person in the world. Who are you going to call? Are you going to call your neighbor? Are you going to call Joe Biden? Are you going to call Obama? Are you going to call the Black Panthers? You're going to call the okay, cops. So, so tell me this. Tell me this then, because the core issue here is use of force, as far as I'm concerned. You know, we we examine some of the weeds around that. Politicians throughout the world, and this would be true on the conservative side now, in the aftermath of the COVID, he doesn't um, just go from tyranny because it was more a tyranny than a pandemic he doesn't just were, go from uh, are now he doesn't just go from zero to 100 immediately i guess he also goes from 100 to zero <laughs> yeah apparently this guy is unstable i know is this bipolar i i i, I don't want to diagnose it's just it's pretty crazy i'd go to a third party for that and you'd have to put face in them yeah, yeah, yeah saying that we actually didn't force anybody to take the vaccine so what do you think there, of that claim? I, like, so let's define like, force. I think it's. Because, I wish he was more Eric Andre about this. Like if he's like in, here and he was like, yeah, I, I am joking. He's like, yeah, or just like he makes it more of a joke. He's like, I don't trust third parties for anything. Well, like when I, I went to my doctor, they said I, I had prostate cancer. I don't listen to them. I'm bleeding from my butthole every day. Yeah. It's unrelated. Yeah. I put it on the bar site. <laughs> no, it's so it's really stupid. Like obviously you have an, to put faith in third parties. It's a claim to make. Yeah. You know? Technically Canada, true, but I think it's silly. What do you mean it's technically true? Define technically force, true and that in the United States, at least, I think the idea, what they tried to do, they weren't able to do it because the Supreme Court shot it down, was Biden tried to make it so that OSHA, who's the body that regulates job safety, could make it so that employees had to get vaccinated. Now, eventually, or what? It was, or what? Or they'd lose their job. Okay, does that qualify as force? That's why I said technically. Yeah, no, no, not... but I'm at, this is a serious question. I mean, because we need to define what constitutes force be before we can... It seems to me... You could argue it's a type of force, sure. I mean, I think it'd be silly to say it's nothing. It is a type of force. It's the same as a cop telling you, you have to do this, you're going to be killed. No, but it's, it's right. on the spectrum. Sure, of course, yeah. It's as much force as the mRNA, mRNA vaccines are vaccines. Sure. It is a type of force, and the mRNA vaccines okay, are a type okay. of vaccines. So, so okay, so okay. I, look, I, really think, I really think the problem was mm -hmm. with the COVID response. I really think the problem was the use of force. I mean, I can understand to some degree, although I'm very skeptical of the pharmaceutical yeah. companies and far more yeah. skeptical than your insistence <clears> upon the utility. Where where are you on the spectrum? I think I think we talked about it. I don't know if it was on the show before, but like uh, I don't think I, I don't think it's like clinically diagnosed as autism, but you know maybe something. Okay. Uh, do you support vaccine mandates? Um, I'll say yes, I do. 
You do? Why, why do you support? And I'm, I'm not, honestly I'm trying to bet. I'm just no, actually I, curious what you believe. I, okay, I, I haven't thought about the position very hard, but I'll say I do and we'll run with it. Why do you? Well, no, I'm not. I'm honestly not trying to get into debate. I'm just actually curious. Like, well, if, you're, I, if you're in the middle, my, you can say that. No, because my you know? answer is I don't know. So this is a form of me figuring it out if I do or not. Okay. Um, um, I'm, I'm okay with vaccine mandates because I think it helps. Um, it protects the general population. And when we talk about like the need for, um, what's it called? Herd immunity. Like you need to have that in part due to the like mandatory aspect of 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 the vaccines. Otherwise, there's no point in like forty percent of the population having it because it's hurting you'll never get a human herd immunity. But why ought we care about the safety of other people? Like, shouldn't we have the ability to do whatever the fuck we want at the end of the day? We should, but that just depends on. Do you think it's more important that you have personal autonomy, or do you think it's more important that like your country is healthy? Uh, but I mean, you're a huge free speech guy, right? Yeah. Like you'd pretty much want no, you wouldn't want to restrict hate speech, for example, right? No, I, like I don't think you should. I, I don't think, think you there should, should be crimes in relation. Yeah, I no, think, I, I think we, yeah, we have, we yeah. have the same position. I think you wouldn't, you wouldn't disagree with the fact. Like I think hate speech should be protected. Hate speech also can certainly hurt people. You yeah, know? for sure. But you wouldn't say that you should lose that right in protection of the public safety. Yeah, I agree. So why is this different? Well, it's like I don't think people who like are going to be hurt by the vaccine should take it. Like that, they, no, but why should anyone be required to do it for public for public good? Because I think there's a difference between like the the bad that comes from hate speech versus the bad that comes from people getting um get it, contracting COVID. And mm-hmm. what, how do you determine what when it reaches a critical mass? Um, well, just I feel like, like you're working from your constellation, honestly. I'm saying the fact that like millions of people dying from something is a lot worse than people being offended by something. <coughs> um. Yeah, but I mean, I mean, I think that's that's a little bit of a understatement of the effect of hate speech, right? Um, it can inspire no, school shootings. It can so. inspire fascist movements. Are millions of people being killed by that right now? Um, no, but I would say death certainly has come as a result of hate speech. I think that would be really hard to argue against. How know? many? I, I don't know. It's a really like hard. Thing. It's a really hard thing to quantify. It's also really it's hard not... for you to quantify one person not taking a vaccine. Did they kill someone? That's true, but I have no problem saying that more people died from COVID than did from hate speech significantly more like multiple um multiple um decimal points more so are you saying that do you do you think some people have died as a result of hate speech um, you agree with that right maybe directly i don't think so no i don't think anyone's directly died from hate speech but i think people have directly died from covid so is it, is, it, is it when there's a direct death caused by it, that's when you are become concerned? That's when you feel like there's a license to remove the right? I think so, unless you can prove that the indirect cause is leading to like a significant amount of deaths. And I don't think an indirect cause of hate speech is leading to a significant amount of deaths. What do you think about smoking in public? Um, I'm, I am think I'm okay with it, yeah. That is something that's quantified. I know 45,000 people in the U.S. die every year from secondhand smoke. Yeah, but that's not public smoking. That's like within the house, like your child lives with you and you're a smoker. So that's- do you think that should be legal? That should be legal. Um, I no, I don't. I don't think that should be legal. Okay, I, I actually, I don't know how I feel about that. All I'm saying is, I think that's like can, can be considered like parent parental negligence is like smoking with your child every single day in the same house. What, why? Uh, but should, I think it's just too too common. Like it's the, should, the norm is that smoking. So even is fine. If, even if I stipulate that that COVID is like the most not taking the vaccine is going to cause this amount of harm more than anything else I could throw at you. Yeah. Um, why should an individual have to care about that harm? And I'm, and by the way, I'll throw out front. I don't think an individual I'll has to. I think front. a government should, though. And that's what it is. Like, the government's mandating it, not like an individual's mandating it. Why should the government have the right to tell you what the to go- do there? I think it's the government's responsibility to protect its population. And if they deem that millions of people in their country are dying from something, then they should take that something and then mandate things that would prevent against those things. Then why would you not apply that to like uh, drugs, for example? Like, like how, how many banned people, drugs? Yeah, how many people die every year from uh, doing drugs? A ton, probably. Yeah, um, let me think about that. Um, do you, like, you, should we just ban drugs? You mean like ban? Because yeah. um, they're not spreading it to someone else necessarily, but they are killing themselves. Because I think it's a lot harder. And this is not unprecedented. The state has intervened in these things before. I think it's a lot harder to mandate. Um, well, so you're essentially like um, comparing like the mandating of vaccines protects people and the banning of drugs would also protect people, right? Yeah. but And specifically in regard to mass deaths. Sure. And I agree with that. But I think that there it's very clear that like a private market can fill the um, can fill like the drug need and people will still do it regardless. Um, but mandating that people take a vaccine, that's something that does 
that 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 that's proven prove, prove effective. Like there isn't going to be like some mass group of people that are all able to not take the vaccine instead. Now it's not like there isn't a private market that can subsidize the amount of people that don't want to get the vaccine. Well, so you're saying that you so in theory would you not have a problem with banning drugs? You're just saying it wouldn't be effective, so it'd be yeah, a waste of resources yes, essentially. So if, if we could actually get rid of alcohol, cigarettes. Um, yeah, probably that, would be better. Right. And I don't think you even disagree with this. I do I think, disagree with that. No, because I think we, I think people have the right to do in what, no, shit that in, hurts themselves. In one of our debates, you were talking about like all of this stuff is like important in the now to to factor in. But you think that there is like certain utopian society that we should eventually strive to, where you said like vape should get removed and and alcohol should get removed. So do you do you not believe in that anymore? I do. But what do I always say? That like it's important to that culture has to now? precede that. Yeah, sure. The, that there has to be a will for it, which so is the same. I, reason why can't I say that about that then? I think it's totally legitimate for the st- for. I think the cu- the culture. Most people were fine with the mandates. I think business. I think I, I think. Okay, here, here's where we agree, right? I think any business should be able to say, "You can't come in here. You can't work here if you don't take vaccine." Sure. Like, private and business, totally fine. Um. I don't think you, if, if someone really like stayed in their house all day, they lived in the middle of the woods, you wouldn't have a problem with them not taking a vaccine, right? It's about the contact with other people. Yeah, probably. It just feels so weird to mandate that on public property, I guess. But I guess you'd say that. Okay, well, from a government that, perspective, which is the only perspective that matters, government. like you can you can personally disagree with mandating a vaccine. But if you were a government, what do you think looks worse? Like that you slightly infringed upon someone's um, like personal autonomy or that you protected millions of people? Like who's going to well, look at how you? how they see it, right? They, who's, look, who's who they? The anti-vaccine. Yeah, that might not be how they see it, but that is what it is. Taking a vaccine is insanely simple and one of the easiest steps you can do to prevent other people from getting sick. So pretend that I was someone who like, because I'm devil's advocating a lot here. Yeah. I think I might actually end up agreeing with you for the point you just made. But yeah. if, if you're talking to, to a, an anti-vax person who said, listen, uh, I understand that a lot of people view it as effective. I don't know the research on it. Mm-hmm. Um, I get that you want to protect other people and I don't want to hurt anyone else. I just don't think I should be forced to put something in my body by the government. Yeah. Like, like, do you view that person as an asshole? Yeah. But I also think that really? like, I would, as an asshole. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's like, you're doing, you're doing something that's insanely easy. Like the level of um, burden that's placed upon you to do something that's very, very. <laughs> but you beneficial. get these people have been exposed to so much cold like information. Oh, about no, no, I, I understand that you don't have that. The empathy for that. No, I do. But that doesn't okay. mean I don't think you're an asshole. I can be empathetic to your position. Like if I'm not saying that I wouldn't have been in that dude, if I was fed that kind of information, I might be anti-vax. I might be all of these things. I might fit into that entire constellation. So I, I guess, I guess I would probably just own the most extreme version of what I'm trying to say, which I do think personal rights are more important than uh, public safety at the end of the day. Why? Because I think that if you open the door to say, I'm able to tell you now, I actually don't agree with that. Do you think someone has the right to just go like kill a bunch of people because they want to? No, I don't. I don't. Hmm. That's something I have to think about more. Yeah. No, that's a good though. The consensus might lead me to believe you're skeptical of them, which is surprising, I would say, given I'm that very skeptical pharmacy- of them. That's why I'm glad there's multiple companies, multiple countries, multiple academic institutions that do research, and the FDA. Yeah, I'm very skeptical. You should be in any private system. You should be skeptical of every private company, of course, whether we're talking media, pharmaceuticals, or automobile manufacturers, yeah. But skepticism doesn't mean a blind adherence to the complete total opposite of whatever it is they're saying, right? They're in doubt, undoubtedly. Like, if you look at how Alzheimer's research, there's been groundbreaking improvement on drugs saying? to treat Alzheimer's research over the past three years that five years ago, none of these drugs even existed. And now- what he just said is one of the was a very brilliant thing to say mm. that skepticism does not mean, Oh, the establishment says this. I believe the exact opposite. Yeah. It's and almost I, a weird allegiance to it. You totally. Know? And I've actually been having a conversation with my friend, um, um, unnamed, um, about this. Um, he was telling me that like, he's very skeptical of a lot of things. Like, and I asked him, are you, Oh, I was like, are you skeptical of everything? And he said, yeah, no, I am. And then he, he presented me with a, um, a media that he finds to be non-biased. And this was about the, like the whole like Trump bloodbath incident, you know? So it's like he said it in context, like he was talking about, like, there's going to be an automotive industry bloodbath, you know, but then if you factor in. And so, like, that was the issue. Then a bunch of left wing media sites took that and said that he's saying there's going to be a bloodbath for the country if he isn't reelected. So that's different without the immediate context. So both things, though, are in don't include the full context. The full context is he held a rally at the start. He's like the national anthem was sung by all the people in jail for January 6th, and he saluted all of them. And like the entire, like, um, like, uh, I think that's silly what you're saying right now. What? 
that I feel like if he said, I, I don't know what you're talking about, but he said there's going to be a bloodbath of automotive industry jobs. But it wasn't just that. He said bloodbath multiple times. He was talking about it, like within the conversation. Okay, then that's, within that's the, fair to criticize. Within if, the context of the entire yeah, conversation, saying criticize. there's a bloodbath is a lot more worrying than what um, people on the right were saying. He just said that. Because like both it, it just, things. Like, that, but my point is like it broadly. It reminds me of when concert. Like, uh, wait, wait, let me just yeah, finish yeah, yeah, this. Yeah, um, so it's like. So that was, at, and then I sent my friend the fuller, the, uh, what I believe to um, give more context and like, which included the start of his speech, which included like his sympathizing of the January 6th insurrectionists. I sent him that and I was like, what do you think about that? And he was like, yeah, I like the context there. So then to that, I said, um, which video did you find to give you more context? And he said, the one that you showed me. And I said, were you skeptical of the media site that you thought was, gave you the best information? Mm -hmm. He was like, no, I guess you're right. I'm not skeptical. Of I don't think I would just say to people in general. If you hear Trump says something or Biden says something, it's pretty easy to find whatever press conference or speech they gave it in. Mm -hmm. You know, just watch it. They're yeah. usually on YouTube within a day. Yeah. Um, but I was going to say, like, uh, do you know who Eric Holder is? Uh, no. He was Obama's attorney general. Okay. Um, you know what the attorney general is, right? The attorney general is different in Canada. Like the attorney general's Okay. In the U.S., it's, it's one of the highest positions of, of, of the cabinet. Okay. It basically means, like, you are you're the highest level of like the public def law basically okay um so they, they have jurisdiction to do a lot of different sh shit mm -hmm. um like jeff sessions was trump's attorney general okay merrick garland is as uh, biden's it's a very powerful position um very similar to the supreme court in terms of like power but he he said at one point he's like what like uh like uh people are saying too much like when republicans go low we should go high i say when they go low we kick them yeah and then which is clearly a metaphor for saying if you're gonna go low like we should fight back yeah exactly but a bunch of republicans are like this guy's advocating for physical violence yeah. against his political enemies and it's like that's not you true. know yeah but it also, it also is true but yeah people will like i agree with that though. but that reminds me of like it, like if trump literally just said there's an, a blood a bloodbath of automotive jobs and then the left took, i would i'm sure they would take that and be like and they did do that yeah and that's crazy but if you're telling me there's more instances but where there is also a more context more than yeah there's, there's yeah. all I'm there's, saying is I don't think it's relevant that okay, like if it, it's, imagine, okay, this, wait, no, I don't know this point though. Imagine that's all he, the only uh, usage of the term bloodbath in that speech was that. Yeah, and then you say, but there's more context to this. He saluted uh, people who were arrested during January 6th before the speech. I don't think that's relevant to that quote. Yeah, it might not be directly relevant to that quote, but let's say those were just the two pieces of information that mattered. Don't you think like him talking about bloodbath and also talking about January 6th? the insurrection in like the same no because speeches are an hour long like 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 if, what if it was 30 seconds long and there was two sentences that were in between then then i would uh, probably have I, I don't i have to watch it but like yeah. like if, i'm just wondering, does the timing of it matter to you or can it not be it does have to be like an hour difference it, 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 i'm just saying like if like if biden had said something like um like um we like um What's something conservatives go at Biden for? He's old. Sure, but like a policy thing, like government student control. debt relief um, doesn't help the people that already paid off their debt. Um, Biden's opening the border. Uh, yeah. Sure. Okay. So if he said something about like we we have to um, make sure that every immigrant who you know, wants to come to this country can, can get in very easily mm -hmm. and they have to do it legally. Yeah. And then Republicans clipped the part where he says all immigrants, Biden wants to open the borders to all immigrants and ran with that. Yeah. You'd probably be like, that's not a fair summation of what he said. Yeah. And then if they turned around and they said, yeah, but at the beginning of the speech, Biden said there was a group of uh, illegal immigrants who were in the crowd. And he said, I appreciate you. Mm -hmm. Would that be relevant context to what the quote was probably a little bit, but yeah, not as much as you're. I, I, I agree, there is like a time differential that matters, and also just like what are you like to, to that specific quote? Like, it feels more of like this guy is also an asshole than like, um, that's directly relevant to the quote. <clears throat> I think yeah. PolitiFact is a great resource people should check out. Do you know that? Um, no, they just evaluate all politician statements and they grade them from like true to like mostly true, half true, mostly mm -hmm. false, false. Yeah, no, that's good. And it's pretty like nonpartisan, okay, which I like. Let's go back. Uh, yeah. So how about if you're skeptical of anyone who's willing to use force to put their doctrine forward? Then you you're skeptical of, of literally every single person, political ideology ever to ever have existed in, in all of humankind. Some degree of force, you would I'm, undoubtedly believe this, right? Some degree of force is probably necessary for any kind of cohesive society, right? No, I don't believe that. Of course there is. 
No, even if you had a tribe that. of 100, 120 people, if somebody was uh, if somebody was stealing something, right, you have to punish that person. I that said can't... earlier that 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 becomes complicated when you're dealing with the psychopathic types, right? So that's a complication. But, but I would say, generally psycho- speaking, but, okay. that. The, the necessity to use force is a sign of bad policy. And no, I don't think, see, I'm not particularly Hobbesian. I don't think that the only reason people comport themselves with a certain degree of civility in civilized society is because they're terrified by the fact that the government has a monopoly on force that can be brought against them at any moment. I think that keeps the psychopaths in line to some degree. But I think that most people are enticed into a cooperative relationship and that formulating the structures that make those relationships possible is a sign of good policy. But back to the vaccine thing, I'm, I'm going to ask you, do you think that if the burden placed on someone to do something for the greater good is less than the um than the damage that otherwise would be incurred they should do it so like if someone um, gets the vaccine it's so easy for them to do that and the benefits so outweigh the 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 negatives so much that they should probably do it like generally so i'm i'm a rule utilitarian in an ethical sense okay which means that I, um ultimately yes if if that were an isolated incident i would agree with that but another thing you have to factor in is what precedent does this set? And if the precedent it sets that is likely to follow will lead to less good overall, then you'd have to, and I would consider that as part sure. of my thing. And I would agree with that within the vaccine. I think if, that, if you, you were able to restricting rights, that could lead to worse outcomes And I think overall. that's true. And then you would also have to talk about what precedent does it set with vaccine mandates. I don't think it really sets a dangerous precedent. Um, I think it absolutely Because if could. the precedent, if this precedent that is set is that someone is very 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 light, well, slightly this, right? burdened yeah, for the benefit ahead. of the greater of the greater good but, okay, that's th- not a bad precedent that's no but set. i don't i think the precedent's being said is if the government tells you you have to take a vaccine then then you have to take it right i agree. imagine yeah. imagine if uh at some point we got a legitimately corrupt but that's that's why that's why i think like the flu vaccine for instance isn't isn't mandatory right because it's political yeah well not because it's political because covid was like an uh, unprecedented like the, it's the, it was the most contagious um virus in all of human history is it incomprehensible to you that at some point in the next 20 years the u.s democracy devolves and like someone like trump is in office and they say ivermectin is a great thing to take and we're going to mandate that everyone takes it now um, and his cult follows along and he forces people to take that it, yeah i mean but yeah but most, most the government is that would, is that incomprehensible to you no that could happen but and this, we lose our science to fight that if we no, no, no i don't this. think we do because within the the precedent that setting the the um, a part of that is the fact that COVID, um, at least obviously they didn't have like, they didn't have long-term studies, but it wasn't a dangerous. But that's not, that's not even to relevant take. to this argument, right? Because like, if that, if, if that, was, I do think it's relevant because I think that if like, if the government was saying that you should need to take ivermectin to protect against COVID, the studies don't back that up. Sure. But like, like ultimately what you're saying is that the government isn't, managed- my, my concern is not, it's not with the quality of the vaccine. I think that if everyone took the COVID vaccine, we'd, the world would be a much better place today. My concern is with the the demand of them to take it, you know? Um, maybe. And if you really think the studies are that good, which they are, then you should just argue that point harder. I'm just saying, do you need to impose that on people in order for them to take it? Um, yeah, I, I think you kind of do because the misinformation was so severe that like a bunch of people, like a bunch, I know a lot of people that took it that didn't want to take well, it. Like, and I think that ultimately benefited everyone. Here's another way of looking at it, right? Everyone dies eventually, right? Yeah. So what we're concerned about is like protecting pr- people. Premature long, long, deaths. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, and like, what, what are the main causes of death in the United States? Um, I think it's like heart disease, obesity, obesity, obesity heart, like gun- uh, car crashes is big. Yeah. Um, we could ban a lot of freedoms and mm-hmm. secure these things. Yeah. You seem like you wouldn't be interested in doing that. And I'm just trying to figure out what is the difference here? Well, I'm just, I'm just um, appealing. Like if we, if we I'm required appealing everyone to, to eat healthier I'm food. I'm appealing to your utopian society of like eventually all of these things that we shouldn't probably be doing will eventually be weeded out. Like, yeah. But, but I, then why not stand by it right now? And because my thing I'm saying is culture has to predate it, and yeah. the fact that he's this popular saying this, and Trump is it. Well, the culture, the, the culture, culture was not predate. there on that. The culture was if, there. Did if you more people mandated, the culture is almost by definition not there. I don't think that, I don't think it was mandated because they were. And worried. I'm not saying 50 percent plus one. I'm saying culture is in the overwhelming majority of people want this. I'm pretty sure the overwhelming majority of people did want the COVID vaccine. Uh, then why are you so concerned if some if some people choose to not take it? Because if you only get if an overwhelming amount, do you think an overwhelming amount is 60, 65 percent? How much do you think is overwhelming? In regards to what it would take for me to ban something, just what do you think is an overwhelming percentage? Like if sixty five percent agree, I want this thing. Is that overwhelming? 
I, I'd want a little bit higher, but like I'm not trying to be. But that's pretty here. much like, it. Yeah. That's pretty much what it was. Like most people took the vaccine out of their own, out of out of. I want fully get own. your argument. I'm just saying, like, why wouldn't you go ahead and and like uh, put restrictions on like, and and this isn't even unprecedented. So Mike Bloomberg, when he was mayor of New York City, mm-hmm. he put sugar taxes on like sugary sodas, right? Yeah. Which is very similar to the COVID thing, I guess, yeah. in a way. You know. I don't mind that. You okay? I I do have a problem with those policies. It happens with cigarettes. Who put a tax on that? You know. Yeah. Um, I think it's weird well, maybe to I do, do, I to do that. It. And then listen, if it's just a fine, I don't really have as much of an issue. I think that's actually completely fine. My only issue is I don't think you should throw someone in jail for not taking the vaccine. Yeah. And I mean, I guess maybe that's true. But I mean, also like to fight, and also to can, fight the point of the yeah, idea of I mandatory. Think I can almost mean you all some people. Way, some people couldn't. Some people didn't need to take the vaccine. Like you could just not take the vaccine and be fired. Yeah, I think I think and effectively you, you could. You any could corporation you should be able to do it. I think that it should kind of come down to town by town, mm-hmm. and the town should probably hold a referendum and say, "Do we want to mandate this or not?" Yeah, and if they say uh, no, then I'm okay with people in that town not doing the the vaccine. Yeah, yeah. but I get what you're saying. I just think I'm that a, I think a lot of people here. are saying like, "Yeah, personal autonomy over like anything," and I just don't think that's true for a lot of things. I don't think people really believe that. I, I would agree with you. I, I'm just saying I think there is an inherent value in personal freedom. That's why I agree I, with and I agree the with policy that. of support. You know? Yeah, but I also think from a government perspective, like saying that you're the head of a government, you care more about protecting your people than you do about some people being mildly disaffected. It seems like it's very significant to you, um, the fact that you can uh, affect others with it. And yeah, I think that's legitimate. Like if, if not, No, it's not just that. It's the fact that you can affect others with it because of something so small that you could do so easily but that's not that shouldn't be relevant to freedom at all you know i think it is kind of relevant i I disagree because how much freedom are you taking away from someone if you're doing something so small what's easier buying a gun or not buying a gun not buying a gun so would you say it's so easy to not buy a gun we should just ban guns and you know it's it's pretty easy to not buy well because there's a difference between not doing something and being told to do something very small it's like yes it's easier to not do it but when we're you know, talking about something where you're mandated, the, no one's being mandated to not buy a gun. People are being mandated to do something. And they're being mandated to do something very, very, very easy. I just, I think that. Because that's what mandated is. So, you know? And it could be. And I would disagree with like stuff if like it comes out in the future that the slippery soap did happen and people are being mandated to do a bunch of things that like you shouldn't have to do. And I would agree with you there. But I don't see that happening yet. I see it in some instances, but that's, we should do a whole podcast about okay, that. Okay. Honestly, I've got to, I have to ask, because I have watched a lot of your stuff in the past. Um, I remember you speaking very distinctly on this, that, for instance, when two men are communicating with each other, there is an underlying threat of force that kind of puts on the guardrails those particular social interactions. For instance, yeah, I the threat of direct, force is yeah. don't be psychopathic. What is it? How broader is psychopathic here? Are we defining? Well, I can define it. I mean, sure, yeah, go for it. Well, a psychopath will gain short-term advantage at the cost of long-term relationship. Okay. That's, That's really the core issue. Well, you know, you, you, made, a, you made a reference to something like that earlier mm-hmm. in your discussion. When you pointed out that people claim to be motivated, let's say by principle, but will default to short-term gratification more or less at the For drop of a hat. Yeah. yeah, 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 exactly. Well, the the exaggerated proclivity to do that is at the essence of psychopathy. So it's a very, it's very think, immature. Curious, with, that, with this definition of psychopathy, does it's that mean the that... definition of psychopathy. It's not ad. It's not mine. That's the core of psychopathy. Okay, I'm not in the in the United States. I think we call it all ASPD now. Um, no, it's, the, it's separate from that's antisocial personality disorder. They're I thought separate. that subsumed psychopathy and sociopathy. psychopathy is no psych, psychopathy is more like some. It's more the pathological core of antisocial personality disorder. Okay, maybe that might so be true. Okay, that's a better way of thinking. Like the worst, a I'm, small I'm, number of criminals are responsible for the vast majority of crimes. It's one percent mm-hmm. commit sixty five percent, something like that. Do you think and, is psychopathy something that can be environmentally induced, or do you think this is core to a person? It's both. Okay. So, for example, if you're disagreeable, like you are, by the way, one of the your proclivity, if you went wrong, would be to go wrong in an antisocial and psychopathic direction. Mm-hmm. That's more true of men, for example, than it is for women. That's why men are more likely to be in prison by a lot. Mm-hmm. I think it's 10 to 1, 20 to 1 generally, it depends on the particular crime, with it being higher proportion of men as the violence of the crime mounts. Mm-hmm. So you can imagine on the genetic versus environment side. So imagine that when you're delivered your temperamental hand of cards, you're going to have a certain set of advantages that go along with them that are part and parcel of the, that genetic determination. And there's going to be a certain set of temptations as well. So for example, if you're high in trait neuroticism, you're going to be quite sensitive to the suffering of others and be able to detect that. That's useful for infant care. Uh-huh. But the cost you'll pay is that you'll be more likely to develop depression and anxiety. And if you're disagreeable, if you're disagreeable, extroverted, and unconscientious, then you're the tilt, the, the place you'll go if you go badly is in the psychopathic or antisocial direction. And there are environmental determinants of that to some degree. Sure. Genes express themselves in an environment. I, I agree. Um, 
when I'm just curious for the definition of psychopathy for short-term gain at the expense of long-term relationship, relationship. Really, that's probably the best bit. Yeah. When yeah. you look at stuff like people that are self-destructive, say people that engage in behavior, at least like obesity, is that like a type of psychopathy to you, or is that like something different? Or how do you define these types of things? I guess, or how do you view that type of thing? Well, the 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 no no, there is an overlap in that addictive processes, one of which might lead to obesity, mm -hmm. do have this problem of prioritization of the short term. But the distinct, so that overlaps with the short-term orientation of the psychopath, but a psychopath is, see, an obese person isn't gaining anything from your demise at to facilitate their obesity, uh -huh. right? So there's a predatory and parasitical element to psychopathy that's not there in other addictive short-term processes. Do you think, is it possible that there are things, because uh, then to circle back to the, the tribal yeah. example I gave, isn't it possible that people can commit harms against other people or they're not necessarily gaining from their demise, but it's just some other sort of gain? That well, they're so for instance, well, like, say, yes. like I'm talking to some person, I'm just gossiping or shit talking to another person. I'm not necessarily feeling good that I'm trashing them per se. I'm feeling good because this group of friends might be more favorably because I have like a gossip or something to share with them. Well, but, the, but that's the gain right there. Mm -hmm. is, and you are contributing to the demise of the people you are, you're gossiping sure. about. But, the, but I think there's like, I feel like there's fundamentally different type of thought process between like, I want to tell you something juicy about this guy because it'll make you like me versus I want to tell you something juicy about this guy because I hate this guy and I want him to like have a worse reputation among people. I feel like this different drivers for that. I would say that's a, that's an interesting distinction. I would say probably probably that the hatred induced malevolence it's is a worse the, form of malevolence than the popularity inducing malevolence. Yeah, the, the know, only reason it's I, a tough one, but yeah, the only reason I bring that up is because I feel like a lot of malevolence that we have social guardrails for is that type of like selfish malevolence where you're not I would argue even the majority of malevolence in the world is usually people acting selfishly or being inconsiderate, not necessarily like I hate this Yeah, I think that's right. I think that well, that's why Dante outlined levels of hell. Yeah. Right? Yeah, well, exactly that. And I mean, that 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 book was an investigation into the structure of malevolence, right? He put betrayal at the bottom. Is it snakes and ladders? What? Right here. <laughs> the ladder. Kind of a snake. No, right. you got uh -huh. Which I think is right. I think that's right. Because like people that, who develop oh, post-traumatic yeah. stress disorder, for example, which almost only accompanies oh, an encounter. 1400s? Like, I, uh, probably way before 2,000 years earlier. Yeah. I don't know, though. Give a shit. Fair with enough. malevolence rather than tragic circumstances, <laughs> they are often betrayed, uh -huh. sometimes by other people, but often by themselves. And yes, there are levels of hell, you know, and you outlined a couple there. Uh -huh. So I guess then my you question is just that. You know what you need, but to be successful? What? Exactly what Erudite was telling you. Because I watched that, I watched some of that last night. What did she tell me? I had to do something? She said that what she does, where the political meets the social, you yeah. know, I think you need an understanding of the world that is completely independent of politics. And to have like, just to have, you should have strong takes about stuff that is not related to politics. I definitely do. Ask me anything. Well, it, just like, what, like, what are your takes? I on always like, have strong takes. Okay. Like, um, okay. Well, why do you think that uh, there are so many incels? And can, can you try to answer that question without being in political? Non yeah. Um, I think the rise of in seldom can probably be attributed a lot to the rise of social media and that insofar as people are just not outside as much, they're able to be online more. It's easier to be online more for a lot of introverts. It's easier to make friends online because you don't have to have the social interaction. So like by nature of you not being able to have social interaction, um, you're not going to be able to have find people to have sex with. So you're just going to have less sex. You're not going to have any sex. So you're an incel. Do you have concerns about like social media addiction in general? Or like, are there other social problems you have an issue with? Like, regardless of what, like, I know when I think about like mental health stuff, social media stuff, I'm not drug stuff. I'm not really actually, thinking about it's politics. Actually, it's just like, I'm, I'm, go, I want to hear you talk. Yeah. The thing that's funny is that I think you think that I might have strong political positions. I think my opinions about things that aren't political are so much stronger. But I'm trying to find like, like the middle because like I know you have a lot of strong opinions about like I mean, this sounds so dickish. I might not even say that actually. What I was gonna say, of course you have strong opinions about like like pop like about like which movie is better mm -hmm. or like that type of stuff. I know that, but like like um, how's that dickish? Well, because I'm not saying that you're either I don't want to say that you're either political that you're either Biden's better than Trump. I'm gonna prove it, or mm -hmm. you know One Piece is better than Death Note. I'm gonna prove it. Sure. Like what what are your what are your social societal stuff that's independent of I, this broader and more deep than than politics that than the pop cultural stuff but isn't as like chronologically this is happening right now it's like this I don't know, you'd have to, ask to me a go question. back into biden you'd have to ask me a question okay, are you concerned about like how much uh so okay so from my perspective i think it's i think addiction is on the rise in yeah. the form of social media and a lot of drugs people are using mm -hmm. and i'm really concerned about that and not necessarily a political way yeah do you have that same concern? Do you have an opinion on that issue? Do you think I'm I'm right or wrong? Do you, 
Yeah, I think Thoughts addiction is definitely on the rise. Um, and this is probably actually what sounds super dickish is I have, don't really have any sympathy to people that like get super addicted. I don't have any sympathy for myself for getting addicted to like my phone, you know? Like I think that it's your job as a good person to be able to break your addiction. I think I find you, right there, I, find you take, yeah. I find you a little bit weak if you can't do that. I'm not saying I can't I, I can do it, you know, but mm -hmm. I'm saying like if you can't beat your addiction, I find it a little bit weak. Mm -hmm. Do you think weakness is on the rise? Yeah, probably. And what, why do you what do you, what do you think that is? Um, just because like what makes you strong? I don't know. Maybe like having like a, opinions about things. Um, we can like outsource our opinions to people that tell us things online now. Like maybe you'd have to go talk to people like at your at a bar. 40 years ago or you'd have to talk to your mm -hmm. family and friends but now you can just watch someone give you an opinion you don't really have like you don't read the paper and then go talk to someone and say i saw this what do you think about this you can just watch someone read the paper and tell you what they thought about it yeah and a lot of that has to do with uh, the dissolution of patience too mm -hmm. you know i think a lot of things that i think are like probably not good things to be really good at um people have i mean so i mean like if we're say, I think there's a lot of people who are really good at being lazy. That's not a good thing. I think there's a lot of people who are really good at being addicted to things. That's not a good thing. I think there's a lot of people who are really good at like doing the bare minimum. I don't think that's good. I think there's like a lot of things that people are really good at right now mm. that don't make you a better person. Yeah, I agree with you. And that's kind of what I was trying to get in the video essay a little bit. You know, mm. it's like there's so many shortcuts that are being like uh, romanticized right now. Yeah. And I think that's a bad thing. If we were to go in the other direction, what are the most positive things you see about our generation? Um, I like that people are talking a lot more about like mental health because I think those are uh, mental health is a very real thing. Um, for the sake of what I think is good, I'm not going to talk about how I think some people make it overblown or whatever. I think it's great that people are talking more about their mental health. I am glad that people feel more comfortable in like their sexual orientation. Like I don't think you should ever feel shamed for like imagine feeling shame for like liking someone, some, someone. Yeah, it's, it's like you don't think about that. It's, it's just something that yeah. is. And you're being shamed for it. You know, yeah. that's horrible. So I'm glad that people feel more comfortable liking who they want to like. Um, what else are we good at? Do you think I, there, there's anything to do with like creativity and uh, like, like, are we better at being creative? <laughs> yeah. Um, no, I don't think, I don't think we're better at being creative. I think that just creativity was probably. I think um, we might be funnier. Um, I think we might, might, might have more could media be. literacy to some extent. Yeah, probably. Um, I mean, in relation to like the media we consume now, I think a lot of people probably couldn't read like a newspaper very well. I think we're open minded to an extent that we don't give uh, ourselves credit for. Ooh, I don't know. Maybe I think we're probably equally open minded and closed minded. I don't think that's really changed. It just depends on like what positions you hold. You know, you're probably closed minded. Like we might be more closed minded than ever right now based on like if someone told if, like someone told you that they were pro life. Like how many people would just shun them from their social group now? You know, a lot. Probably pretty close minded in that sense. Maybe. I don't know though. Cause it's like the thing is we were sold this idea a lot that that's how we operate. But I think like honestly, like like if one of your close friends told you that, or like well, you see yourself in a different light. You're talking about other people when you talk about this, right? You see yourself as outside of your generation to some extent. Um yeah. I think right? I think yeah, no, I do. I think I'm a lot better than a lot of people, but I mean yeah. That's like, I probably shouldn't say that, but I do think that's true. That doesn't mean I'm, oh, I guess I shouldn't say I'm better than people. I think I'm better at some things than a lot of people. I have some very woke friends. I think if I told them I was pro-life and I've, I've told, I've had more Like here's people. one thing I'll say. I think people are a lot more empathetic nowadays. I think I'm more empathetic than most people my age because I'm empathetic to pretty much everyone. I'm empathetic to like a conservative who's anti-vax, who um, wants to vote for Trump. What do you think you need to work on in terms of, uh, person relationships like with other people like just uh, in any way as it intersects with other people um what do i need to work on in terms of relationships yeah or just like any way you interact with other humans um i don't give people compliments so um but do you view that as a negative thing like something that you actually think is bad yeah because i think that like so like if you think of a person that you like think of someone who you think is like really nice right no, that's not how this works what like okay i'm asking you just to think of someone yes. who's really nice. someone someone who is nice would probably give compliments more no, I want you to think of a person who you think is really nice. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Do you have, do they compliment you like a decent amount? Do they make you feel good about yourself? Yeah. Yeah. I don't really do that that much. Like I don't affirm people very often. Do you think, think of someone that you think is really nice? Yeah. Do they compliment people a lot? Um, More than I do. Yeah. Do you, do you want to be like them in that way? No, I don't really care about it, but I'm saying like people. So if you don't care, then I'm saying. But it's not about what I care about. You're asking like, what do I think makes someone better? I think no, no, like, that's not what I'm asking. I, well, you I, said I, what you, you, I'm well, saying what, what can you grow on? 
Well, I can grow on that. I do, if I, ca- I don't but care do about to? it. No. No. Is there anything that you care about that you're not doing? Oh, what do I care about yeah. wanting to grow? Because then what we can find from that is the limits that are placed. Oh, on what do I care about growing on? Yeah. Um, or do you think that everything you're doing is by definition the right thing to do? The right thing to do for me. I, like I like doing the things that I do. All right, that's interesting. Um, that's very interesting. What do I want to grow on? You don't think there's anything that's like I wish I could do this, but I feel limited. I feel like I can't do it. I don't really think there's anything I can't do other than maybe like some type. Um, actually, no, I don't know. Uh, I couldn't, That's I couldn't join the oh. NBA. There's no way I could ever do that. I couldn't be the but best. You, but you view that system as, as unfair against you, right? No, I'm just not good enough. I'm too late in my age. I like, I haven't trained enough. These are all things outside of your control. That's what I'm saying. Basically. Yes. They are. Yeah. There's nothing within your control that you would want, that you would want to exercise control on. Cause you feel like anything that is within your control, you're by definition of you doing it. It is the right thing for you to do. I think anything within my control, I could probably do if I wanted to. So therefore, what you're doing that is within your control is what you should be doing. Um, Yeah, probably should be doing, I guess. Yeah. 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 I agree with that like 99%. What do you disagree with? I, I mean, there's some things I would like to change that I feel like I can't, you know? Well, well I don't, I'm not saying I don't want to change anything. Like, I don't care about being, like, a nicer person per se, but I can obviously see the benefits of it. It's just, I feel like that's kind of a sad way to look at the world. Why is it sad? The only times you'd, you'd want to change would be for, like, uh, something outside of, of uh, that, that if you were to become nicer, the reason would be personal benefit. Yeah, but that's where you do everything. Like, what what do you want to change that wouldn't benefit you? I just feel like what you and Destiny share well, what do you, that I've broken from a yeah. bit is, like, the ability to just kind of, like, step back and be like, I don't really know everything. And when I hear a bird sing in the park, I'd like that, you know? Well, I, I, don't, I don't have to have I don't think I know. That, I don't think you know? I know everything. There are other things you like that you just don't have a reason for. Um, do you like nature? Do you like uh, yeah, med- nature med- probably meditation? Cool. Um, yeah. I like the idea, probably, of meditation. I'm sure it would benefit yeah. me. But basically, my entire point with this diet thing, this is all interesting. We can talk about this more. But like, I think that if you could partner some of this stuff with the politics, you could be a very influential person. Yeah. I honestly think that this aspect of me is much more um, thoughtful than the politics side. Like, I think you, this is like something that surprised me because you've said a lot of things um, like over the course of our friendship that has made me think that you think I know way more about politics than I do. Because I think you know way more about politics than I do. I it's It's actually convenient for me that culture and politics overlap so much because I think my culture is something that I like very noticeable of. So you might think I'm better at politics just because I know, I feel like I know culture way better. That's possible. You know, um, you do have a lot of cultural insight. That's for sure. And I don't talk about that as much. I, I think that you do have a passion though, for like politics, you know, like you really I, I might like have a passion for culture it. though. You might. Yeah. Maybe what I'm talking about isn't culture as much. Then. It's more just like, like ephemeral stuff, you know, I think that's really interesting to me, at least like mm-hmm. talking about much longer term ways of like, what is different in like our generation from other generations? How do we think about stuff differently? How do we feel differently? Yeah. I think there, that those conversations are really, really important to have, you mm-hmm. know, more important than politics arguably, but it's not really a competition. It's just like, that has to be part of your analysis. Like you're like the Anton theory we're talking about longer term goals, yep. bigger ideas about society at large, you know, mm-hmm. that's the kind of stuff that would really like, I think if you, if you could add that, it's like if Giannis got a fucking three, you know, well, it's just like someone has to ask me like the right questions, you know, like I'm like, I'm pretty, I'm like a pretty open book and I think I have a lot of thoughts in my brain, and that's fine, but I just had someone, someone context, has to prompt it in you know? media context. You have to create your own shot. Absolutely. For sure. Um, and I agree with that, but creating my own shot might just be like bringing like talking to someone who's going to ask good questions, you know? Sure. Yeah. And that, that, you know, I think that might be a good point. And that's probably why this is uh, dynamic. Yeah. If you have people, so the kid that steals an orange from a stand, not because he hates the shop owner, but because he wants the orange or he's hungry, without some type of societal, it doesn't have to be the government. It could be family, religious, without some type of use of force. Do you think that society ever exists without- Use force on your wife? Um, <laughs> well, what are we considering force? Is withholding sex, for instance, is that considered force? Or is, uh, you know, saying we're going to cancel a vacation? Deprivation of an expected reward is a punishment. So, um, so you sure. could- well, no, but, but I mean, this is a serious question. I mean, yeah. look, look, if we're, we're thinking about the optimization of social structures, mm-hmm. we might as well start from the base level of social structure and scaffold up. Sure. So right? I, 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 like if a wife is upset at a husband, for instance, yeah, would that be considered yeah, uh, use of so force? Good. I think a negative punishment. You're removing a stimulus yeah. to punish a person. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Would you consider that like a use of force? Or I would say it would depend to some degree on the intent. The intent is to punish. A well, if the right? intent is to punish, then then it's starting to move into the into the domain of force. I mean, look. Mm-hmm. 
Look, while we've been talking, you know, there's been bursts of emotion, right? Yeah. And that's because we're freeing and only on Jordan Peterson's side. <laughs> it's a good point. Yeah, there have been when you did this. Entropy <laughs> and trying to close and to enclose it again. Uh -huh. And so that's going to produce, it produces negative emotion fundamentally, most fundamentally anxiety and pain and secondarily something like anger because those emotions are quite tightly linked. Sure. And so within the confines of a marriage, because we might as well make it concrete, there are going to be times when disagreements result in bursts of emotion. Uh -huh. And those bursts of emotion don't necessarily have to have an instrumental quality right? It's when the emotion is used manipulatively to gain an advantage that's short-term for the person, and then maybe that's at the expense of the other person, or even at the expense of the person who benefits future self, then it starts to tilt into the manipulative. There's a, there's a tetrad of, of, of traits. Mm -hmm. So narcissism, Machiavellianism, that's manipulativeness. Nar narcissism is the desire for unearned social status. That's what you'd gain, for example, if you were gossiping and elevating mm -hmm. your social status. Machiavellianism, narcissism, psychopathy, that's predatory parasitism, and those culminate in sadism. And that if anyone got here, good for them. But um, this is what I was thinking. This is two things that we can do, and only two. Um, we're going to finish this bit. We're, we're too close to Yeah, no. okay. um, then this would take a lot of, this would take effort on both of our parts. I think one, well, I mean, the idea is you create a bunch of questions for me, and then I create a bunch of questions for you for your interview. And it's this, but we interview each other. Sure. Would that be in the podcast format or would that be like its own video type thing? It'd be its own video. But, like I, we I, literally I, have like yeah. a sit down thing like this, you know, mm. and it's not really going to be debate. It might be fleshing things out, but it's like what just happened right here. I think was really interesting. I agree. Yeah. And I think we could call him like a, uh, we'll just, Miles you could call Anton. Theory. Yeah, that's the other idea I had. Yeah. That cloud of negative that. emotion that's released Cause in you, the you, aftermath you of disagreement. We're deep enough into this. We can just kind of talk a bit. Yeah. Like, do you understand the value of that? Yeah. I think it like helps me think about like who I am more. Um, I think there's value in like people watching it, you know? Yeah. Um, it works on every level. Yeah. I think it's even super helpful. Him, who I consider a genius. Yeah. Like he, he's not fueled by, I think this about this issue, or even I have these morals that lead to the, there's some greater thing, things that he cares about. Like he cares about research and people like, digging deep into stuff mm -hmm. there's flaws he talks about like i've heard him talk many times about like um when people ask you a bunch of questions about yourself and don't talk much that makes them feel good mm -hmm. you know that makes the other person feel good yeah and he says i understand this but i'm not impervious to it either yeah so when people do this for me it makes me well feel that's good like too, the, you know? about the compliment thing i understand that but i also understand that like treat people how you want to be treated and that's why i do want to work on it i don't particularly give a shit about it but i know that it makes me feel good when people compliment me so i understand i should probably try to compliment people yeah and i think that that is is the same domain that i'm talking about um yeah i just think that's so sociopathic in nature um it might be i don't know i've, been, maybe I've been called that before so that's fine and i wouldn't even say that that's unique i think a lot of people feel that way they're just not transparent about it but what i've learned is that that's not better you know yeah like, I, I feel like, and I'm not great at this, but I want to be able to appreciate things beyond me, my understanding of them or my benefit from them, you mm -hmm. know? Like, for me, like, psychedelics and, like, falling in love for the first time, like, like those things really impacted my, my view of, like, there's just some stuff that doesn't apply to these types of conversations that can't be viewed through this lens, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's kind of religious in a way. Maybe that's what I'm talking about, some sort of, like, like, I don't believe in God or spirits or any of that. I just think there are some things that transcend talking about them as if, are they right or wrong? Is this good or bad? You know? Yeah. And I, I'm just, I'm very curious. Well, and that's you why would that be with anything. That's yeah. why every time you said like, and do you think this is like the right way to do it? I tried to like fight the idea. I was like, I don't know if I think it's, I don't think it's the right thing to do in the sense that I prescribe it to people, but it's the way that I do it. You know? Fair enough. Yeah. And I, I was saying that I, I think I'm, I'm trying to formulate even what I'm talking about right now, but yeah. like, yeah, that, that, that's a good point can be tilted in the direction of those traits. And that's when it becomes malevolent. And that's when the problem of force starts to become paramount. Because I, I think I think that your I think that your fundamental presupposition was both Hobbesian and ill formed. I do not believe that the basis for the civilized polity is force. Now you're saying that you know you can't abjure the use of force entirely. And I would say unfortunately that's true. I'd but, agree with you. But if the if the policy isn't invitational, uh -huh. if I can't make a case that that's powerful enough for you to go there voluntarily then the policy is flawed. Now, it may be that we have some cases where we can't do better than a flawed policy because we're not smart enough. And mm -hmm. maybe the incarceration of mo of criminals with a long-term history of violent offenses is a good example of that. We don't know how to invite those people to play. Mm -hmm. they, they have a history, generally from the time they're very young children, 
from the age of two of not being able to play well with others. And it's a very, very intractable problem. There's no evidence in the social science literature at all that hyper-aggressive boys by the age of four can ever be socialized in the course of their life. The penological evidence suggests that if you have multiple offenders, your best bet is to keep them in prison till they're 30. Oh, and the reason for that is it yeah. might be delayed maturation, you know, biologically speaking, but most criminals start to burn out around 27. So it spikes, it's a big spike when puberty hits and then stability among the hyper-aggressive types. So actually what happens is the aggressives at four tend to be aggressive their whole life and then they decline after 27. Uh -huh. The normal boys are not aggressive. They spike at puberty and go back down to baseline. Right. And so you don't really rehabilitate people in prison for all. Yes. The interview's over. Fucking go. What is a woman? Please. How the hell are you still showing a what is a woman <laughs> ad? It's, did you watch it? Turn off the cameras. I think I watched a bit of it. The documentary that we're about to watch explores the hot button issues of transgender. Does it? It does explore the hot button issues. It's literally like, oh, you can't say you, what, you can't give the definition of woman. Yeah. And now I'm going to go talk to Jay Peterson. He just interviews like 10 professors and he's just like, what is a woman? He's like, oh, oh. What somebody else's truth is might not be my truth. Gender dysphoria. Oh. And gender... Re Obvious reasons. I mean, look at the bloody places. They're great schools for crime in, in large. But if you keep them there until they're old enough, they tend to mature out of that, except the worst of them, tend to mature out of that predatory, short-term oriented lifestyle. So, yeah. yeah and they, that's agree. the force issue. Yeah, like, I agree, I agree. So I... Fundamentally, to, to clear uh, my my um, I guess my stance up, I agree that fundamentally you're not building society on force. Uh, if for no other reason, because there'd be so much friction, it would fly apart at the seams, right? You, you can't force- You get resistance if yeah, you use force. Yeah, fundamentally we're building off of cooperation. You want to invite people to participate in society. I agree with that. I just, I feel like once you start to hit certain thresholds or certain points and you've got so many different types of people involved, um, at some point we're going to have to have force around the edges and the guardrails just to make sure that we don't- allow, Are you familiar with like tit for tat systems? Very. Yeah, tit for tat is probably a really- <laughs> He did not like that condescending. Are you familiar with this? Very. <laughs> Like, I'm more familiar than you will ever be. He's kind of a jackass. The important part of our evolutionary biological history and an important part of the animal kingdom. And I think to some degree, that tit for tat punishment is important. Is that too. force or justice? You can call Dude, it what it is. No, no, no. I'm curious. Fuck out. It's that force or justice. But also, like, he's. And just, am I talking to he's Satan? So full of shit. It's insane. It's what you think. I'm, I'm very, this is a very serious question. Yeah. Because the tit for tat, the tit for tat is very bounded, right? It's yes. like. You cheat, I whack you, yep. and then I cooperate. Right? Yeah. So, and, and I do think that there's a model there for what we actually conceptualize as justice. Sure. It's like you don't get to get away with it, but the goal is the reestablishment of the cooperative endeavor as fast as possible. Of course, I agree. But in a reductionist way, we're kind of just using justice here as a stand-in for force, right? Well, because I, I think it's a tit, well, a tit for tat system. That's a good, a tit for, a tit, so there are different types of tit for tat systems, right? You've got tit, tit for tat, you've got tit for tat tat, you've got, there's all sorts of types of systems where maybe you'll let somebody make a mistake one or two times, but you can't have a tit, 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 tit system because then somebody can come in and take advantage of it. Yes, so that, which is the problem with the compassionate left, exactly. by the way. For, to some extent, sure, it can be. Mm -hmm. um, or a problem with the right that's far too forgetting of Donald Trump. <laughs> um, but I would say that that tat part, the, you can call it justice. I think justice is a perspective of force, right? Where some people might consider a force to be just, the cop that arrests the murderer, and other people might consider that force, that tat, to actually be injustice because the, the murderer was responding to environmental conditions, blah, 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 or was yeah, that's or whatever. a stupid theory, that Which, responding to environmental conditions theory. Because well, I mean, here's it why it's, no, it's not. Well, it's, I mean, because essentially that's Rittenhouse. So, 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 so is, here's is why. With so if you assume that there's a causal pathway from early childhood abuse to criminality, uh -huh. let's say, which is the test case for environmental determination of the proclivity for the exploitation of others, okay. then it spreads It spreads near exponentially in populations. That isn't what happens. So here, here's the data. Most people who abuse their children were abused as children, but most people who are abused as children do not abuse their children. And the reason for that is because if you were abused, there's two lessons you can learn from that. One is identify with the abuser. The other is don't, Never gonna... right, exactly. And what happens, and if this didn't happen, every single family would be abusive to the core very rapidly. Yeah. What happens is the proclivity for violence itself, it, it dampens itself out with it, as a consequence of intergenerational transmission. So the notion that privation is a pathway to criminality, that's not, that's not a, that's not a well-founded, that's not a well-founded formulation. And, and there are an infinite. I wonder if he believes in like intergenerational trauma then. Because if he, if, does he look like he does? No, he doesn't. But I feel yeah. like it's interesting if he's saying like that it slowly gets dampened, like the more um, abuse that occurs, like it will slowly like peter out yeah. essentially is the idea. Right. Um, but I wonder, like, I don't believe in the, inter in the generational trauma in the sense that like, if someone gets punched, the child in 20 years will feel what that punch is. But the person might talk about get having gotten punched and that child might be like more worried about getting punched in the future. Right. 
Yeah. I don't know. A number of counterexamples, and they're crucial. Uh -huh. and some of the best people I know, and I, I mean that literally, are people who had childhood so absolutely abysmal that virtually anything they would have done in consequence could have been justified. You know, and they chose yeah. not. To I do think that is an issue with the left. I, th I think that there's something almost like um, psycho it, psychological. I mean, like the blaming it on everything other than the individual. Yeah, it seems like there's such a reticence to do that ever, and I and. I get that sometimes that should be true. Maybe, yeah, for sure. It's just like, it seems like they just would rather blame systems on everything, which, and I think that the, 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 if we go back to our thing, like I think the misconception that I have, and this, is, this would be something I think about, is that we why do we extrapolate systems as something that is not human? You mm -hmm. know, if you're going to say, oh, this is the cause of, of uh, other shit, like, there is nothing outside of ourselves that we create. Everything is just a network of us doing a certain thing. Whether mm -hmm. it's capitalism or social, we all, we all choose to co collaborate with these things all, all day and we create them. We are them, you know? Yep. It's really weird when people like are like, oh no, th this uh, other thing created this. It's like, no, that's just that's just us working to do something, you know? Yeah. You mean other than like they act as if it's not human entity? Yeah. Yeah. It feels very odd. Yeah. It also just feels like it's not, it's like not accountability. You know, like, yes, it's true that um, there are historical factors for why um, people, well, there's historical factors for why people are put into situations today that might make them more predisposed to crime, mm -hmm. but they still committed the crime. Yeah. You know, that's still like on an individual, you still committed the crime. And in, in even in some situations, I would agree with the left. It's like, like in a cult, for example, I can get how a brainwashed person or a could act in a way that they really do not have accountability for. Mm -hmm. But that is not most crime. That is not a significant portion of crime. That's not like most of this shit is people choosing to do things, you know? Yeah. And it's just stupid. It's just, it is. He's right. It is fucking stupid. Yeah. You know? It's like a part of the conversation. It's just a bummer that he's not interested in well, solving it's annoying these that, problems. It's, so it's annoying that happen. people aren't factoring in both of it. You know, it's like I bet there's a lot of people on the right that think that it's absolute bullshit. It's up to the entirely up to the individual whether or not they want to commit a crime. Which is true to some extent, but it's also true to the other. To, to it's also true on the other side that there are environmental factors as to why people commit crime. Yeah. And so it's like both things have to be a part of the conversation. Exactly. To turn into the predators of others, and that was a choice, and often one that caused them to reevaluate themselves right down to the bottom of their soul. And so that casual association of relative poverty, even with criminality, we know also we know this too. You take a neighborhood where there's relative poverty, the young men get violent. They don't get violent because they're all hurt and they're victims. They get violent because they use violence to seek social status. And so even in that situation, it's not, oh, the poor, poor. It's no wonder they're criminal because they need bread. It's like, sorry, buddy, that's not how it works. The hungry women feeding their children don't become criminals. The extraordinarily ambitious young men who feel it's unfair that their pathway to success become violent. And that's 100% that's well-documented and generally by radically left-leaning scholars. Sure, so I don't disagree about that. So it's like... No, I agree with that. It's the same, like, people... So is he saying, it, like, men will do it? You know? Like, there's an important difference between women and women and men doing it? Yeah, I guess he is saying that. But I feel like all of this just kind of works against his own argument, you know? Yeah, I know. That's what I mean. But I agree with all the observations he's making. Yeah. You know? I disagree with any of that. Wealth inequality in areas is a much better predictor of crime than, than poverty. Than right, but it's a very that. specific form yeah. of crime. For it's sure. status-seeking crime by young men, mm -hmm. right? Well, but, but that shows you what the underlying motive I is. I wish I could ask him right now. What is, what is what's status seeking crime? So it's just like, like robbery. This man and then like you like, ga like you gas up to your friends. You're like, I just did this or like, or you're attaining assets. Oh, that kind of status. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Sure. It's not even redress of the economic inequality. It's actually the men striving to become sexually attractive by gaining position in the dominance hierarchy. Well, I, think you, be, I, think be, about I think you have to be really careful. I feel like a lot of this is so true. And like, I, I don't know why, but I'm thinking about like, like Kendrick Lamar right now. I feel like that is another criticism of this that addresses a lot of this mm -hmm. stuff. If you, if, you listen, if you listen to like a good kid, Mad City, I think that's very similar to what Jordan's saying right now. Um, <clears throat> I just wish it wasn't wrapped in all this like weird religious shit, you know, and conservative shit. Like, pro like provide a solution then, homie. Yeah. And I know what it is because I know his books. It's clean your room. And yeah. it's like, that's not effective, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but I agree with the criticism. Yeah. You know. Well, with that assessment, though, because you can say that it's not economically, uh, it's not seeking economic. Why do you have to be careful? The biggest because, predictor because, of because, male. Well, because we're assuming that people that commit crime in these types of circumstances are status seeking and not trying to seek uh, economic remedy. But That's it might exactly be exactly what we're assuming. But it might be the case, for instance, that in economically prosperous areas, that the men there aren't actually seeking economic prosperity. They're also just trying to elevate status, but they do it through <laughs> economic prosperity. It's potential, right? They do it. They do it with a longer term vision in mind. Sure, sure they're trying to elevate. I wouldn't disagree with that in in the least. Sure, but they do it with a much longer time horizon in. 
in mind. And we know this partly because there have been detailed studies of gang members, for example, in Chicago, who are trying to ratchet themselves up the economic ladder, but they do it with a short-term orientation. Most of them think they're going to be dead by their early 20s. So they're trying to maximize short-term gain. So it has nothing to do with the with the redress of economic inequality, except in the most fundamental sense. And it is status-driven because they're com- they're looking for comparative status. Sure, I, just, I, just, I, just, I don't think any human being has baked in a desire to seek economic prosperity. I think that that's like a third order thing that we look for. And fundamentally, it's probably more like safety, security for ourselves and then status-seeking for other things. I think like, that changes when you have children. Um, no, well, I mean, the safety security your status your is relevant or starts to become irrelevant. At that I, point. I mean, depending on how you do your status, right? <laughs> You can't do that every time we have a discussion. Sure. Well, I'm just saying, for instance, one of the important things for my child is to be able to send my child to a good school. I need to have an elevated status, right? I need to be able to buy a house in the right school district. Or I need to be able to pay the education. Right, but go. you're not yeah. telling me, I hope, mm-hmm. that the driving factor behind your desire to care for your children is an elevation in your status. No, but I'm saying that the oh. elevation of status might be what allows you to take care of yourself. So, for instance, one of the biggest predictors of getting married is, is already status achieving or it. position. Well, I, well, that's what I'm saying. I'm saying there's like a, there's a, I know all of these things kind of play me. into, yeah. Okay, look, mm-hmm. we're running out of time. <laughs> You're good. You're okay, smart. Wait, 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 You're yeah, smart. Go back. I should say that, that tit for tat smart. thing. I was just yeah. saying that the tat thing, there is some underlying built into probably our genes, right? Because you see it all throughout the animal kingdom, that there's some level of punishment or justice. some level of force. You justice. justice. No, but, but I think I think it's the right... It's I really justice think when you're the tatter, not when you're the titter, though, right? No, no, no. It's just retribution. No, 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 no I don't yeah. think that's true either. Look, if you read Crime and Punishment, for example, one of the things you see that emerges when Raskolnikov gets away with murder, and it's a brutal murder, and he gets away with it, it's completely clear, and he has a justification for it. And what happens as a consequence is that that disturbs his own relationship with himself so profoundly that he can't stand it, such that when a just punishment is finally meted out to him, it's a relief. And that's not rare. And that is, like, there isn't anything more terrifying. This is why Crime and Punishment is such a great novel. There isn't anything more terrifying than breaking a moral rule that you thought you had the ability to... Yeah, no, don't read Dostoevsky. That shit's really fucking hard. I forget what I read. It was hard to read. It's for some class. What did I read? Was, uh, Did he write Crime and Punishment? Yeah, and he wrote another. Or there was a Tolstoy. Why don't you no, just no, do no, like the spark was... notes? I did for a lot, but it's just like, dude, reading those fucking 1800s, like, you're it's you're hard. actually ultimately right. I think uh, all these old things are really hard to read and they'll kind of suck. But the ideas are interesting. It's just like, yeah, you just gotta like get a really, really, really smart person to. Care so, brother does whatever. Yeah. Get a smart, get a really, really smart person to rewrite it, you know? Yeah, that'd be good. Break and finding out that you're somewhere now that you really don't want to be. And then that, you know, you know, there's nothing worse in your own life than waiting for the other shoe to drop. Mm-hmm. If you've transgressed against the moral rule and now you're an outsider because of that, you live in no man's land. The fact that you have just re- retribution coming to you, that can be a precondition for your atonement and your integration back True. into society. But it's probably important to note that depending on the system you exist in, those moral transgressions just aren't, right? So to take it back to, I'll use your leftist example, you might consider a threat of force for somebody to get a vaccine to be a highly immoral thing that might be a transgression against some fundamental moral thing, but a person on the left might think that they're actually satisfying their moral requirement to society by doing so, much the same as a child soldier, or or, or not only use child soldier, but maybe an older person that's committing intifada or some kind of Islamic terrorist thinks that they're fulfilling some moral calling as well. Right? No doubt, no doubt that that's the case. That's why I was focusing in on the use of force, is right. that I think it's a rule of a good rule of thumb policy that if you have to implement your goddamn scheme with force, then there's something wrong with the way it's formulated. Does it there's no reason religious... we could have used we could have used a pure invitational strategy to distribute the vaccine. It would have been much more effective. And it was bad policy, rushed. We're in an emergency. We have to use force. It's like no, no, you weren't. It wasn't. It wasn't the kind of emergency that justified force. Not least because I don't like that it, people like have these positions retro retroactively, or yeah, that's right. Um, I, I, retrospectively, I it's like it felt like an emergency at the time. That's what people were doing, you know? That's why, like, there's probably a virus playbook now. And also, you, know? you can't test it, right? Yeah. You, you like, just, if he's right, we would never know if he's right or wrong. Yeah, it's like... what happened, happened. Yeah. You know, we don't Could know... Could have been way worse. An invitational might might have been worse. You yeah. Know? Behavioral psychologists have known for decades that force is actually not a very effective motivator. It produces a vicious kickback. So, you know, one of the things... This is going to happen for sure, you know, is that the net deaths from people stopping using valid vaccines as a consequence of general skepticism about vaccination is going to cause, in my estimation, over any reasonable amount of time, far more deaths than COVID itself caused. You you violate people's trust in the public health system at your great peril, and you do that by using force, and we did that. And so you can see already that there's hordes of people who are vaccine skeptic, Very this generalized skepticism that, to some degree, you were rightly decrying. It spreads like wildfire. And no wonder, because if you make me do something, I'm going to be a little skeptical of you for a long time. You know, this conversation, we're here voluntarily. Mm -hmm. Like, we're trying to hash things out and in good faith, you know. But neither of us compelled the other to come here and neither of us are compelled to continue. And so that makes it a fair game. And a fair game is something that everyone can be invited to. And I suppose that's something that's neither right nor left, you know, hopefully, right? Something we could conceivably agree on. And I also think that 
I don't have any illusions about the fact that there are people on the right who would use power to impose what they believe to be their core, their core, what their core, the core, what would you say? Their core idol. Of course, the, the temptation to use force point, is rightly pointed to by the leftists who insist that power is the basis for everything. It, it isn't the basis for everything. That's wrong. It's really wrong. But it's a severe enough impediment to progress forward that we have to be very careful about it. So, look, we have to we have to stop. Sure, sure, yeah. I want to know if there's anything else yeah. you'd like to say oh, before yeah. we stop, because yeah. unfortunately yeah. we have to stop rather abruptly. And so, uh, I think I, I yeah I feel like we got I feel like we got pretty far into this. Um, okay, what are you yeah. cool. <laughs> trying to trying to accomplish? Let's start we'll stop with that. We we found a little bit about we found out a little bit I about who you are. I mean, you formulated your your proclivity in terms of to some degree in terms of delight in argumentation or facility at it, mm -hmm. which you certainly have. Um, the danger in that, of course, is that you you can be oriented to win arguments rather than to pursue the truth. And that's the danger of having that facility for argumentation. Sure. But what are you hoping to accomplish by engaging in conversations like this in the public sphere? Elevation of status, you know, Absolutely. that's one possibility. Uh, no, I, I feel like um, I think debate or argumentation is good because it forces two sides to make their ideas somewhat commensurate to the other. Mm -hmm. uh, if two people are having a conversation, they have to be able to communicate that ideas to the other person. Otherwise, it's just a screaming match. And I think there is a good for the sake of like just being bipartisan or having a collection of people in a certain area and having different people together, just that in and of itself without anything else happening, I think produces a good, at least for a democratic society. Uh, for instance, like I would agree that uh, school, uh, maybe not faculty, but administrators are very, 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 very far left today. D dangerously so, I don't have to talk to you about this, obviously. Um, but I think part of the responsibility to that, I think rests at the feet of conservatives who, instead of uh, maintaining participation in the system, decide that they're gonna throw their hands up and disengage. Uh, when I go and I see- Or be forced out. Or be forced out, sure. In my case, That's fine, example. yeah, sometimes it can happen. But I think that often. rather, than, oh, rather than accepting being forced out, or rather than uh, encouraging other people to disengage, the engagement has to happen. Mm -hmm. It can't be a, yeah. I'm losing faith in the system, so all of us are gonna do our thing. Well, it has to be like, no, we're gonna be here in these conversations, whether you like it or not, because in a democracy, sometimes the guy you don't like wins. Sometimes the policy that you don't like is enforced. Sometimes a guy you don't like is somebody you have to share an office or a classroom with. And we need to be okay with that. And I'm worried that like the internet is driving people into these like very homogenous, but very so polarized groups. The, the data on that, by the way, aren't clear. Like whatever's driving polarization uh -huh. doesn't seem to be as tightly related to the creation of those internal bubbles as you might think. Like I, I've looked at a number of studies that have investigated to see whether people are being driven into homogenized information bubbles. And it isn't obvious that that's the case directly, although it, the polarization that you're pointing to that you're concerned about, that seems to be clearly happening. So, and why that is, well, that's a matter of, you know, intense speculation. I feel like the homogeneity, I, I feel like it's not so much, this is not research-based at all, just a total feeling, yeah. so I admit that. But the feelings that I have is, it's not necessarily that homogeneity has increased, it's that homogeneity has increased as a byproduct of the bubbles becoming larger. So for instance, it might be that, I'm from Omaha, Nebraska, so a, a town in, or city really, in Nebraska, right? It might've been that 50 years ago, uh, there are bubbles in living in Omaha, and there are different bubbles for living in Lincoln. And there might be bubbles in Toronto, or neighborhoods in Toronto, or there might be bubbles in Vancouver, but now as the internet exists and things become more uh, internationalized, these bubbles are, it's not just a bubble that exists in these cities, now the bubbles have come together. Yeah, and as well, a result of them coming together- That's another problem. Sure, yeah, mm -hmm. or a globalization problem or a communication yeah, problem. But yeah, you run well, into this issue where somebody might yeah. be in a particular city or state and have a really strong opinion about what uh, AOC says, but they don't know anything about their local political scene. And I think that that's an issue because the bubbles have gotten so large and they're encompassing so many people now, and you're expected to have like a similar set of beliefs between all of these different people now that might live in totally different places. That's, I think, a, a big issue mm -hmm. we're running into. Yeah, well, that could be, we'll close with this, I mm -hmm. think. That might be one of the unintended consequences of hyperconnectivity, sure. right? Is that we're driving levels of connectivity that we that get rigid and that we also can't tolerate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Well, that's a good place to stop. Um, well, thank you very much for coming in today. That's much appreciated. And um, you're a sharp debater and, <laughs> and good on your so. feet. So that's that's fun to see. And I do think that your closing remarks were correct, is that the the alternative to talking is fighting. Mm -hmm. Right. So when we stop talking, it's not like the dis disagreements are going to go away. Yeah. We will start fighting. Yeah. Right. Probably and and for talking, marriages too, even. Talking, right, right. Absolutely. And talking can be very painful because a conversation can kill one of your cherished beliefs and you will suffer for that. Although maybe it'll also help you. Uh -huh. But the alternative to that death by offense is death. Right. Yeah. Right. So better to substitute the abstract argumentation for the actual physical combat. For sure. Right. Sometimes right. like the worst relationships are the ones where uh, where couples fight a lot. It's yeah, like that's really right. bad ones are where they don't fight well, ever. And then all of a sudden there's the, a yeah. the couples, who, the couples <laughs> yeah. who fight and reconcile exactly. are the ones that yeah, yeah. yes, exactly. All right. All right. Well that was good. Thank yeah, you very thanks. much. And for everyone watching and listening no, on the YouTube no, platform, no, thank you very much for your time and attention. And to no, um, we're gonna spend another 
Nah. Another half an hour or so on the Daily Wire side. So oh, he's no. plugging, he's plugging the yeah, table. Yeah, I know he's going to plug. That's why. Yeah. All right. Thank right. you, everyone, for watching. If you made it three hours, holy fuck. Two and a half. You're a hero. Yeah. Um, thanks, thanks to Jordan for not asking Destiny about open relationships. I thought that was coming. Uh, like and subscribe. See you guys later.